Section 24 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 7, Chapter 1. It was one of those gorgeous and enduring sunsets that seemed to linger as if they wished to celebrate the mid period of the year. Perhaps the beautiful hour of impending twilight never exercises a more effective influence on the soul than when it descends on the aspect of some distant and splendid city. What a contrast between the serenity and repose of our own bosoms and the fierce passions and destructive cares girt in the walls of that multitude whose domes and towers rise in purple lustre against the resplendent horizon! and yet the disturbing emotions of existence and the bitter inheritance of humanity should exercise but a modified sway and entail but a light burden within the circle of the city into which the next scene of our history leads us for it is the sacred city of study of learning and of faith and the declining beam is resting on the dome of the radcliffe lingering on the towers of christchurch and maudlin sanctifying the spires and pinnacles of holy st mary's a young oxonian who had for some time been watching the city in the sunset from a rising ground in its vicinity lost as it would seem in meditation suddenly rose and looking at his watch as if remindful of some engagement hastened his return at a rapid pace he reached the high street as the blenheim light post coach dashed up to the star hotel with that brilliant precision which even the new generation can remember, and yet which already ranks among the traditions of English manners. A peculiar and most animating spectacle used to be the arrival of a first-rate light coach in a country town. The small machine, crowded with so many passengers, the foaming and curvetting leaders, the wheelers more steady and glossy, as if they had not done their ten miles in the hour, the triumphant bugle of the guard, and the haughty routine with which the driver, as he reached his goal, threw his whip to the obedient ostlers in attendance, and, not least, the staring crowd, a little awestruck, and looking for the moment at the lowest official of the stable, with considerable respect, altogether made a picture which one recollects with cheerfulness, and misses now in many a dreary market-town. Our Oxonian was a young man about the middle height, and naturally of a thoughtful expression and rather reserved mien. The general character of his countenance was, indeed, a little stern, but it broke into an almost bewitching smile, and a blush suffused his face as he sprang forward and welcomed an individual about the same age who had jumped off the Blenheim. "'Well, Coningsby!' he exclaimed, extending both his hands. "'By Jove, my dear Milbank, we have met at last,' said his friend." and here we must for a moment revert to what had occurred to coningsby since he so suddenly quitted paris at the beginning of the year the wound he had received was deep to one unused to wounds yet after all none had outraged his feelings no one had betrayed his hopes he had loved one who had loved another misery but scarcely humiliation and yet tis a bitter pang under any circumstances to find another preferred to yourself it is about the same blow as one would probably feel if falling from a balloon. Your Icarian flight melts into a grovelling existence scarcely superior to that of a sponge or a coral, or redeemed only from utter insensibility by your frank detestation of your rival. It is quite impossible to conceal that Coningsby had imbibed for Sidonia a certain degree of aversion which in these days of exaggerated phrase might even be described as hatred. And Edith was so beautiful, and there had seen between them a sympathy so native and spontaneous, creating at once the charm of intimacy without any of the disenchanting attributes that are occasionally its consequence. He would recall the tones of her voice, the expression of her soft dark eye, the airy spirit and frank graciousness sometimes even the flattering blush with which she had ever welcomed one of whom she had heard so long and so kindly it seemed to use a sweet and homely phrase that they were made for each other the circumstances of their mutual destinies might have combined into one enchanting fate and yet 
Had she accorded him that peerless boon, her heart, with what aspect was he to communicate this consummation of all his hopes to his grandfather, ask Lord Monmouth for his blessing, and the gracious favour of an establishment for the daughter of his foe, of a man whose name was never mentioned except to cloud his visage? Ah, what was that mystery that connected the haughty house of Coningsby with the humble blood of the Lancashire manufacturer? Why was the portrait of his mother beneath the roof of Millbank? Coningsby had delicately touched upon the subject both with Edith and the Wallingers, but the result of his inquiries only involved the question in deeper gloom. Edith had none but maternal relatives, more than once she had mentioned this, and the Wallingers on other occasions had confirmed the remark. Coningsby had sometimes drawn the conversation to pictures, and he would remind her with playfulness of their first unconscious meeting in the gallery of the Rue Tranchée. Then he remembered that Mr. Milbank was fond of pictures. Then he recollected some specimens of Mr. Milbank's collection, and after touching on several which could not excite suspicion, he came to a portrait, a portrait of a lady. Was it a portrait or an ideal countenance? Edith thought she had heard it was a portrait, but she was by no means certain, and most assuredly was quite unacquainted with the name of the original, if there were an original. Coningsby addressed himself to the point with Sir Joseph. He inquired of the uncle explicitly whether he knew anything on the subject. Sir Joseph was of opinion that it was something that Millbank had somewhere picked up. Millbank used often to pick up pictures. Disappointed in his love, Coningsby sought refuge in the excitement of study and in the brooding imagination of an aspiring spirit. The softness of his heart seems to have quitted him for ever. He recurred to his habitual reveries of political greatness and public distinction, and as it ever seemed to him that no preparation could be complete for the career which he planned for himself, he devoted himself with increased ardour to that digestion of knowledge which converts it into wisdom. His life at Cambridge was now a life of seclusion. With the exception of a few Eton friends, he avoided all society. And indeed his acquisitions during this term were such as few have equalled, and could only have been mastered by a mental discipline of a severe and exalted character. At the end of the term Coningsby took his degree, and in a few days was about to quit that university, where on the whole he had passed three serene and happy years in the society of fond and faithful friends, and in ennobling pursuits. He had many plans for his impending movements, yet none of them very mature ones. Lord Vere wished Coningsby to visit his family in the north, and afterwards to go to Scotland together. Coningsby was more inclined to travel for a year. Amid this hesitation, a circumstance occurred which decided him to adopt neither of these courses. It was commencement, and coming out of the quadrangle of St. John's, Coningsby came suddenly upon Sir Joseph and Lady Wallinger, who were visiting the marvels and rarities of the university. They were alone. Coningsby was a little embarrassed, for he could not forget the abrupt manner in which he had parted from them but they greeted him with so much cordiality that he instantly recovered himself, and turning, became their companion. He hardly ventured to ask after Edith. At length, in a depressed tone and a hesitating manner, he inquired whether they had lately seen Miss Milbank. He was himself surprised at the extreme light-heartedness which came over him the moment he heard she was in England, at Milbank, with her family. He always very much liked Lady Wallinger, but this morning he hung over her like a lover, lavished on her unceasing and the most delicate attentions, seemed to exist only in the idea of making the Wallingers enjoy and understand Cambridge, and no one else was to be their guide at any place or under any circumstances. He told them exactly what they were to see, how they were to see it, when they were to see it. He told them of things which nobody did see, but which they should. He insisted that Sir Joseph should dine with them in hall. Sir Joseph could not think of leaving Lady Wallinger. Lady Wallinger could not think of Sir Joseph missing an opportunity that might never offer again. Besides, they might both join her after dinner. 
except to give her husband a dinner coningsby evidently intended never to leave her side and the next morning the occasion favourable being alone with the lady sir joseph bustling about a carriage Coningsby said suddenly, with a countenance a little disturbed, and in a low voice, "'I was pleased, I mean surprised, to hear that there was still a Miss Milbank. I thought by this time she might have borne another name.' Lady Wallinger looked at him with an expression of some perplexity, and then said, "'Yes, Edith was much admired, but she need not be precipitate in marrying. Marriage is, for a woman, the event.' edith is too precious to be carelessly bestowed but i understood said coningsby when i left paris and here he became very confused that miss millbank was engaged on the point of marriage with whom our friend sidonia i am sure that edith would never marry monsieur de sidonia nor monsieur de sidonia edith tis a preposterous idea said lady wallinger but he very much admired her said coningsby with a searching eye possibly said lady wallinger but he never even intimated his admiration but he was very attentive to miss millbank not more than our intimate friendship authorized and might expect you have known sidonia a long time it was monsieur de sidonia's father who introduced us to the care of mr wallinger said lady wallinger and therefore i have ever entertained for his son a sincere regard besides i look upon him as a compatriot recently he has been even more than usually kind to us especially to edith while we were at paris he recovered for her a great number of jewels which had been left to her by her uncle in spain and what she prized infinitely more the whole of her mother's correspondence which she maintained with this relative since her marriage nothing but the influence of sidonia could have effected this therefore of course edith is attached to him almost as much as i am in short he is our dearest friend our counsellor in all our cares but as for marrying him the idea is ridiculous to those who know monsieur sidonia no earthly consideration would ever induce him to impair that purity of race on which he prides himself Besides, there are other obvious objections which would render an alliance between him and my niece utterly impossible. Edith is quite as devoted to her religion as Monsieur Sidonia can be to his race. A ray of light flashed on the brain of Coningsby as Lady Wallinger said these words. The agitated interview, which never could be explained away, already appeared in quite a different point of view. He became pensive, remained silent, was relieved when Sir Joseph, whose return he had hitherto deprecated, reappeared. Coningsby learnt in the course of the day that the Wallingers were about to make, and immediately, a visit to Hellingsley, their first visit. Indeed, this was the first year that Mr. Milbank had taken up his abode there. He did not much like the change of life, Sir Joseph told Coningsby, but Edith was delighted with Hellingsley, which sir joseph understood was a very distinguished place with fine gardens of which his niece was particularly fond when coningsby returned to his rooms those rooms which he was soon about to quit for ever in arranging some papers preparatory to his removal his eye lighted on a too long unanswered letter of oswald millbank coningsby had often projected a visit to oxford which he much desired to make but hitherto it had been impossible for him to effect it, except in the absence of Millbank, and he had frequently postponed it that he might combine his first visit to that famous seat of learning with one to his old schoolfellow and friend. Now that was practicable, and immediately Coningsby wrote to apprise Millbank that he had taken his degree, was free, and prepared to pay him immediately the long-projected visit three years and more had elapsed since they had quitted eton how much had happened in the interval what new ideas new feelings vast and novel knowledge though they had not met they were nevertheless familiar with the progress and improvement of each other's minds their suggestive correspondence was too valuable to both of them to have been otherwise than cherished and now they were to meet on the eve of entering that world 
for which they had made so sedulous a preparation. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 There are few things in life more interesting than an unrestrained interchange of ideas with a congenial spirit, and there are few things more rare. How very seldom do you encounter in the world a man of great abilities, acquirements, experience, who will unmask his mind, unbutton his brains, and pour forth in careless and picturesque phrase all the results of his studies and observation, his knowledge of men, books, and nature. On the contrary, if a man has by any chance what he conceives an original idea, he hoards it as if it were old gold, and rather avoids the subject with which he is most conversant, from fear that you may appropriate his best thoughts. One of the principal causes of our renowned dullness in conversation is our extreme intellectual jealousy. It must be admitted that in this respect authors, but especially poets, bear the palm, they never think they are sufficiently appreciated, and live in tremor lest a brother should distinguish himself. Artists have the repute of being nearly as bad. And, as for a small, rising politician, a clever speech by a supposed rival or suspected candidate for office destroys his appetite and disturbs his slumbers. One of the chief delights and benefits of travel is that one is perpetually meeting men of great abilities, of original mind, and rare acquirements, who will converse without reserve. In these discourses the intellect makes daring leaps and marvellous advances. The tone that colours our afterlife is often caught in these chance colloquies, and the bent given that shapes a career. And yet perhaps there is no occasion when the heart is more open, the brain more quick, the memory more rich and happy, or the tongue more prompt and eloquent, than when two school-day friends, knit by every sympathy of intelligence and affection, meet at the close of their college careers, after a long separation, hesitating, as it were, on the verge of active life, and compare together their conclusions of the interval, impart to each other all their thoughts and secret plans and projects, high fancies and noble aspirations, glorious visions of personal fame and national regeneration. Ah, why should such enthusiasm ever die? Life is too short to be little. Man is never so manly as when he feels deeply, acts boldly, and expresses himself with frankness and fervour. Most assuredly there never was a congress of friendship wherein more was said and felt than in this meeting so long rejected, and yet perhaps on the whole so happily procrastinated between Coningsby and Millbank. In a moment they seemed as if they had never parted. Their faithful correspondence, indeed, had maintained the chain of sentiment unbroken. But details are only for conversation. Each poured forth his mind without stint, not an author that had influenced their taste or judgment, but was canvassed and criticised, not a theory they had framed, or a principle they had adopted, that was not confessed. Often, with boyish glee still lingering with their earnest purpose, they shouted as they discovered that they had formed the same opinion, or adopted the same conclusion. They talked all day and late into the night. They condensed into a week the poignant conclusions of three years of almost unbroken study. And one night, as they sat together in Millbank's rooms at Oriel, their conversation having for some time taken a political colour, Millbank said, now, tell me, Coningsby, exactly what you conceive to be the state of parties in this country, for it seems to me that if we penetrate the surface, the classification must be more simple than their many names would intimate. The principle of the exclusive constitution of England, having been conceded by the Acts of 1827, 28, and 32, said Coningsby, a party has arisen in the state who demand that the principle of political liberalism shall consequently be carried to its extent, which it appears to them is impossible without getting rid of the fragments of the old constitution that remain. This is the destructive party, a party with distinct and intelligible principles. They seek a specific for the evils of our social system in the general suffrage of the population." 
they are resisted by another party who having given up exclusion would only embrace as much liberalism as is necessary for the moment who without any embarrassing promulgation of principles wish to keep things as they find them as long as they can and then will manage them as they find them as well as they can but as a party must have the semblance of principles they take the names of the things that they have destroyed thus they are devoted to the prerogatives of the crown although in truth the crown has been stripped of every one of its prerogatives they affect a great veneration for the constitution in church and state though every one knows that the constitution in church and state no longer exists they are ready to stand or fall with the independence of the upper house of parliament though in practice they are perfectly aware that with their sanction the upper house has abdicated its initiatory functions and now serves only as a court of review of the legislation of the house of commons whenever public opinion which this party never attempts to form to educate or to lead falls into some violent perplexity passion or caprice this party yields without a struggle to the impulse and when the storm has passed attempts to obstruct and obviate the logical and ultimately the inevitable results of the very measures they have themselves originated or to which they have consented this is the conservative party i care not whether men are called whigs or tories radicals or chartists or by what nickname a bustling and thoughtless race may designate themselves but these two divisions comprehend at present the english nation with regard to the first school i for one have no faith in the remedial qualities of a government carried on by a neglected democracy who for three centuries have received no education what prospect does it offer us of those high principles of conduct with which we have fed our imaginations and strengthened our will i perceive none of the elements of government that should secure the happiness of a people and the greatness of a realm but in my opinion if democracy be combated only by conservatism democracy must triumph and at no distant date this then is our position the man who enters public life at this epoch has to choose between political infidelity and a destructive creed this then said millbank is the dilemma to which we are brought by nearly two centuries of parliamentary monarchy and parliamentary church tis true said coningsby we cannot conceal it from ourselves that the first has made government detested and the second religion disbelieved many men in this country said millbank and especially in the class to which i belong are reconciled to the contemplation of democracy because they have accustomed themselves to believe that it is the only power by which we can sweep away those sectional privileges and interests that impede the intelligence and industry of the community and yet said coningsby the only way to terminate what in the language of the present day is called class legislation is not to entrust power to classes you would find a locofoco majority as much addicted to class legislation as a factitious aristocracy the only power that has no class sympathy is the sovereign but suppose the case of an arbitrary sovereign what would be your check against him the same as against an arbitrary parliament but a parliament is responsible to whom to their constituent body suppose it was to vote itself perpetual but public opinion would prevent that and is public opinion of less influence on an individual than on a body but public opinion may be indifferent a nation may be misled may be corrupt if the nation that elects the parliament be corrupt the elected body will resemble it the nation that is corrupt deserves to fall but this only shows that there is something to be considered beyond forms of government national character and herein mainly should we repose our hopes if a nation be led to aim at the good and the great depend upon it whatever be its form the government will respond to its convictions and its sentiments do you then declare against parliamentary government far from it 
I look upon political change as the greatest of evils, for it comprehends all. But if we have no faith in the permanence of the existing settlement, if the very individuals who established it are, year after year, proposing their modifications or their reconstructions, so also, while we uphold what exists, ought we to prepare ourselves for the change we deem impending? Now, I would not that either ourselves or our fellow citizens should be taken unawares as in 1832, when the very men who opposed the reform bill offered contrary objections to it which destroyed each other, so ignorant were they of its real character, its historical causes, its political consequences. We should now so act that, when the occasions arrive, we should clearly comprehend what we want, and have formed an opinion as to the best means by which that want can be supplied. Now, I would not that either ourselves or our fellow citizens should be taken unawares as in 1832, when the very men who opposed the Reform Bill offered contrary objections to it which destroyed each other, so ignorant were they of its real character, its historical causes, its political consequences. We should now so act that when the occasions arrive, we should clearly comprehend what we want and have formed an opinion as to the best means by which that want can be supplied. For this purpose I would accustom the public mind to the contemplation of an existing though torpid power in the Constitution, capable of removing our social grievances were we to transfer to it those prerogatives which the Parliament has gradually usurped and used in a manner which has produced the present material and moral disorganization. The House of Commons is the house of a few. The sovereign is the sovereign of all. The proper leader of the people is the individual who sits upon the throne. Then you abjure the representative principle? Why so? Representation is not necessarily, or even in a principal sense, parliamentary. Parliament is not sitting at this moment and yet the nation is represented in its highest as well as in its most minute interests. Not a grievance escapes notice and redress. I see in the newspaper this morning that a pedagogue has brutally chastised his pupil. It is a fact known over all England. We must not forget that a principle of government is reserved for our days that we shall not find in our Aristotles or even in the forests of Tacitus nor in our Saxon Wittengemotes, nor in our Plantagenet Parliaments. Opinion is now supreme, and opinion speaks in print. The representation of the press is far more complete than the representation of Parliament. Parliamentary representation was the happy device of a ruder age, to which it was admirably adapted, an age of semi-civilization, when there was a leading class in the community, but it exhibits many symptoms of desuetude. It is controlled by a system of representation more vigorous and comprehensive, which absorbs its duties and fulfills them more efficiently, and in which discussion is pursued on fairer terms, and often with more depth and information. And to what power would you entrust the function of taxation? to some power that would employ it more discreetly than in creating our present amount of debt and in establishing our present system of imposts. In a word, true wisdom lies in the policy that would affect its ends by the influence of opinion, and yet by the means of existing forms. Nevertheless, if we are forced to revolutions, let us propose to our consideration the idea of a free monarchy established on fundamental laws, itself the apex of a vast pile of municipal and local government, ruling an educated people, represented by a free and intellectual press. Before such a royal authority, supported by such a national opinion, the sectional anomalies of our country would disappear. Under such a system, where qualification would not be parliamentary, but personal, even statesmen would be educated, we should have no more diplomatists who could not speak French, no more bishops ignorant of theology, no more generals-in-chief who never saw a field. Now there is a polity adapted to our laws, 
our institutions, our feelings, our manners, our traditions, a polity capable of great ends and appealing to high sentiments, a polity which, in my opinion, would render government an object of national affection, which would terminate sectional anomalies, assuage religious hearts, and extinguish chartism. "'You said to me yesterday,' said Milbank, after a pause, quoting the words of another, which you adopted, that man was made to adore and to obey. Now you have shown me the means by which you deem it possible that government might become no longer odious to the subject. You have shown how man may be induced to obey. But there are duties and interests for man beyond political obedience, and social comfort and national greatness, higher interests and greater duties. How would you deal with their spiritual necessities? You think you can combat political infidelity in a nation by the principle of enlightened loyalty? How would you encounter religious infidelity in a state? By what means is the principle of profound reverence to be revived? How, in short, is man to be led to adore? Ah, that is a subject which I have not forgotten, replied Coningsby. I know from your letters how deeply it has engaged your thoughts. I confess to you that it has often filled mine with perplexity and depression. When we were at Eton, and both of us impregnated with the contrary prejudices in which we had been brought up, there was still between us one common ground of sympathy and trust. We reposed with confidence and affection in the bosom of our church. Time and thought with both of us have only matured the spontaneous veneration of our boyhood, but time and thought have also shown me that the church of our heart is not in a position, as regards the community, consonant with its original and essential character, or with the welfare of the nation. The character of a church is universality, replied Milbank. Once the church in this country was universal in principle and practice, when wedded to the state, it continued at least universal in principle, if not in practice. What is it now? All ties between the state and the church are abolished, except those which tend to its danger and degradation. What can be more anomalous than the present connection between state and church? Every condition on which it was originally consented to has been cancelled. That original alliance was, in my view, an equal calamity for the nation and the church, but at least it was an intelligible compact. Parliament, then consisting only of members of the established church, was, on ecclesiastical matters, a lay synod, and might, in some points of view, be esteemed a necessary portion of church government. But you have effaced this exclusive character of Parliament. You have determined that a communion with the established church shall no longer be part of the qualification for sitting in the House of Commons. There is no reason, so far as the Constitution avails, why every member of the House of Commons should not be a dissenter. But the whole power of the country is concentrated in the House of Commons. The House of Lords, even the monarch himself, has openly announced and confessed, within these ten years, that the will of the House of Commons is supreme. A single vote of the House of Commons in 1832 made the Duke of Wellington declare, in the House of Lords, that he was obliged to abandon his sovereign in the most difficult and distressing circumstances. The House of Commons is absolute. It is the State. L'État c'est moi. The House of Commons virtually appoints the bishops. A sectarian assembly appoints the bishops of the established church. They may appoint twenty hoadleys. James the Second was expelled the throne because he appointed a Roman Catholic to an Anglican see. A Parliament might do this tomorrow with impunity. And this is the Constitution in Church and State which Conservative dinners toast. The only consequences of the present union of Church and State are that on the side of the State there is perpetual interference in ecclesiastical government, and on the side of the Church a sedulous avoidance of all those principles on which alone church government can be established, and by the influence of which alone can the Church of England again become universal. 
but it is urged that the state protects its revenues no ecclesiastical revenues should be safe that require protection modern history is a history of church spoliation and by whom not by the people not by the democracy no it is the emperor the king the feudal baron the court minion the estate of the church is the estate of the people so long as the church is governed on its real principles the church is the medium by which the despised and degraded classes assert the native equality of man and vindicate the rights and power of intellect it made in the darkest hour of norman rule the son of a saxon peddler primate of england and placed nicholas breakspear a hertfordshire peasant on the throne of the caesars it would do as great things now if it were divorced from the degrading and tyrannical connection that enchains it you would have other sons of peasants bishops of england instead of men appointed to that sacred office solely because they were the needy scions of a factitious aristocracy men of gross ignorance profligate habits and grinding extortion who have disgraced the episcopal throne and profaned the altar but surely you cannot justly extend such a description to the present bench surely not i speak of the past of the past that has produced so much present evil we live in decent times frigid latitudinarian alarmed decorous a priest is scarcely deemed in our days a fit successor to the authors of the gospels if he be not the editor of a greek play and he who follows st paul must now at least have been private tutor of some young nobleman who has taken a good degree and then you are all astonished that the church is not universal why nothing but the indestructibleness of its principles however feebly pursued could have maintained even the disorganized body that still survives and yet my dear coningsby with all its past errors and all its present deficiencies it is by the church i would have said until i listened to you to-night by the church alone that i see any chance of regenerating the national character the parochial system though shaken by the fatal poor law is still the most ancient the most comprehensive and the most popular institution of the country the younger priests are in general men whose souls are awake to the high mission which they have to fulfil and which their predecessors so neglected there is i think a rising feeling in the community that parliamentary intercourse in matters ecclesiastical has not tended either to the spiritual or the material elevation of the humbler orders divorce the church from the state and the spiritual power that struggled against the brute force of the dark ages against tyrannical monarchs and barbarous barons will struggle again in opposition to influences of a different form but of a similar tendency equally selfish equally insensible equally barbarizing the priests of god are the tribunes of the people o oh, ignorant that with such a mission they should ever have cringed in the antechambers of ministers or bowed before parliamentary committees the utilitarian system is dead said coningsby it has passed through the heaven of philosophy like a hailstorm cold noisy sharp and peppering and it has melted away and yet can we wonder that it found some success when we consider the political ignorance and social torpor which it assailed anointed kings turned into chief magistrates and therefore much overpaid estates of the realm changed into parliaments of virtual representation and therefore requiring real reform holy church transformed into national establishment and therefore grumbled at by all the nation for whom it was not supported what an inevitable harvest of sedition radicalism and infidelity i really think there is no society however great its resources that could long resist the united influences of chief magistrate virtual representation and church establishment i have immense faith in the new generation said millbank eagerly it is a holy thing to see a state saved by its youth said coningsby and then he added in a tone of humility if not of depression 
but what a task what a variety of qualities what a combination of circumstances is requisite what bright abilities and what noble patience what confidence from the people what favour from the most high but he will favour us said millbank and i say to you as nathan said unto david thou art the man you were our leader at eton the friends of your heart and boyhood still cling and cluster round you they are all men whose position forces them into public life it is a nucleus of honour faith and power you have only to dare and will you not dare it is our privilege to live in an age when the career of the highest ambition is identified with the performance of the greatest good of the present epoch it may be truly said who dares to be good dares to be great heaven is above all said coningsby the curtain of our fate is still undrawn we are happy in our friends dear millbank and whatever lights we will stand together for myself i prefer fame to life and yet the consciousness of heroic deeds to the most widespread celebrity end of chapter two Section twenty five of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book seven, chapter three. The beautiful light of summer had never shone on a scene and surrounding landscape which recalled happier images of English nature and better recollections of English manners than that to which we would now introduce our readers. One of those true old English halls now unhappily so rare built in the time of the tudors and in its elaborate timber framing and decorative woodwork indicating perhaps the scarcity of brick and stone at the period of its structure as much as the grotesque genius of its fabricator rose on a terrace surrounded by ancient and very formal gardens the hall itself during many generations had been vigilantly and tastefully preserved by its proprietors there was not a point which was not as fresh as if it had been renovated but yesterday. It stood a huge and strange blending of Grecian, Gothic, and Italian architecture with a wild dash of the fantastic in addition. The lantern watch-towers of a baronial castle were placed in juxtaposition with Doric columns employed for chimneys, while under oriel windows might be observed Italian doorways with Grecian pediments beyond the extensive gardens an avenue of spanish chestnuts at each point of the compass approached the mansion or led into a small park which was table-land its limits opening on all sides to beautiful and extensive valleys sparkling with cultivation except at one point where the river darl formed the boundary of the domain and then spread in many a winding through the rich country beyond such was hellingsley the new home that Oswald Millbank was about to visit for the first time. Coningsby and himself had travelled together as far as Darlford, where their roads diverged, and they had separated with an engagement on the part of Coningsby to visit Hellingsley on the morrow. As they had travelled along, Coningsby had frequently led the conversation to domestic topics. Gradually he had talked, and talked much of Edith without an obtrusive curiosity he extracted unconsciously to his companion traits of her character and early days which filled him with a wild and secret interest the thought that in a few hours he was to meet her again infused into his being a degree of transport which the very necessity of repressing before his companion rendered more magical and thrilling how often it happens in life that we have with a grave face to discourse of ordinary topics while all the time our heart and memory are engrossed with some enchanting secret the castle of his grandfather presented a far different scene on the arrival of coningsby from that which it had offered on his first visit the marquis had given him a formal permission to repair to it at his pleasure 
and had instructed the steward accordingly. But he came without notice at a season of the year when the absence of all sports made his arrival unexpected. The scattered and sauntering household roused themselves into action, and contemplated the conviction that it might be necessary to do some service for their wages. There was a stir in that vast, sleepy castle. At last the steward was found, and came forward to welcome their young master, whose simple wants were limited to the rooms he had formerly occupied. Coningsby reached the castle a little before sunset, almost the same hour that he had arrived there more than three years ago. How much had happened in the interval! Coningsby had already lived long enough to find interest in pondering over the past. That past, too, must inevitably exercise a great influence over his present. He recalled his morning drive with his grandfather to the brink of that river which was the boundary between his own domain and Hellingsley. Who dwelt at Hellingsley now? Restless, excited, not insensible to the difficulties, perhaps the dangers of his position, yet full of an entrancing emotion in which all thoughts and feelings seemed to merge, Coningsby went forth into the fair gardens to muse over his love amid objects as beautiful. A rosy light hung over the rare shrubs and tall fantastic trees, while a rich yet darker tint suffused the distant woods. This euthanasia of the day exercises a strange influence on the hearts of those who love. Who has not felt it? Magical emotions that touch the immortal part. But for Coningsby, the mitigating hour that softens the heart made his spirit brave. Amid the ennobling sympathies of nature, the pursuits and purposes of worldly prudence and conventional advantage subsided into their essential nothingness. He willed to blend his life and fate with a being as beautiful as that nature that subdued him, and he felt in his own breast the intrinsic energies that in spite of all obstacles should mould such an imagination into reality. He descended the slopes, now growing dimmer in the fleeting light, into the park. The stillness was almost supernatural. The jocund sounds of the day had died, and the voices of the night had not commenced. His heart, too, was still. A sacred calm had succeeded to that distraction of emotion which had agitated him the whole day, while he had mused over his love and the infinite and insurmountable barriers that seemed to oppose his will. Now he felt one of those strong, groundless convictions that are the inspirations of passion that all would yield to him as to one holding an enchanted wand. Onward he strolled, it seemed without purpose, yet always proceeding. A pale and then gleaming tint stole over the masses of mighty timber, and soon a glittering light flooded the lawns and glades. The moon was high in her summer heaven, and still Coningsby strolled on. He crossed the broad lawns, he traversed the bright glades. Amid the gleaming and shadowy woods he traced his prescient way. He came to the bank of a rushing river foaming in the moonlight, and wafting on its blue breast the shadow of a thousand stars. O oh, river, he said, that rollest to my mistress, bear her, bear her to my heart. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Lady Wallinger and Edith were together in the morning-room of Hellingsley, the morrow after the arrival of Oswald. Edith was arranging flowers in a vase, while her aunt was embroidering a Spanish peasant in correct costume. The daughter of Millbank looked as bright and fragrant as the fair creations that surrounded her, beautiful to watch her as she arranged their forms and composed their groups, to mark her eye glance with gratification at some happy combination of colour, or to listen to her delight as they wafted to her in gratitude their perfume. Oswald and Sir Joseph were surveying the stables. Mr. Milbank, who had been daily expected for the last week from the factories, had not yet arrived. "'I must say he gained my heart from the first, said Lady Wallinger. "'I wish the gardener would send us more roses,' said Edith. "'He is so very superior to any young man I ever met,' continued Lady Wallinger. 
"'I think we must have this vase entirely of roses. "'Don't you think so, aunt?' inquired the niece. "'I am fond of roses,' said Lady Wallinger. "'What beautiful bouquets Mr. Coningsby gave us at Paris, Edith!' "'Beautiful!' "'I must say I was very happy when I met Mr. Coningsby again at Cambridge,' said Lady Wallinger. "'It gave me much greater pleasure than seeing any of the colleges.' "'How delighted Oswald seems at having Mr. Coningsby for a companion again,' said Edith. "'And very naturally,' said Lady Wallinger. "'Oswald ought to deem himself fortunate in having such a friend.' I am sure the kindness of Mr. Coningsby when we met him at Cambridge is what I shall never forget. But he always was my favourite from the first time I saw him at Paris. Do you know, Edith, I liked him best of all your admirers. Oh, no, aunt, said Edith, smiling. Not more than Lord Beaumanoir. You forget your great favourite, Lord Beaumanoir. But I did not know Mr. Coningsby at Rome, said Lady Wallinger. I cannot agree that anybody is equal to Mr. Coningsby. I cannot tell you how pleased I am that he is our neighbour. As Lady Wallinger gave a finishing stroke to the jacket of her Andalusian, Edith, vividly blushing, yet speaking in a voice of affected calmness, said, Here is Mr. Coningsby, aunt. And truly, at this moment, our hero might be discerned, approaching the hall by one of the avenues, and in a few minutes there was a ringing at the hall bell, and then, after a short pause, the servants announced Mr. Coningsby and ushered him into the morning-room. Edith was embarrassed. The frankness and the gaiety of her manner had deserted her. Coningsby was rather earnest than self-possessed. Each felt at first that the presence of Lady Wallinger was a relief. The ordinary topics of conversation were insufficient plenty. Reminiscences of Paris— impressions of Hellingsley, his visit to Oxford, Lady Wallinger's visit to Cambridge. In ten minutes their voices seemed to sound to each other as they did in the Rue de Rivoli, and their mutual perplexity had in a great degree subsided. Oswald and Sir Joseph now entered the room, and the conversation became general. Hellingsley was the subject on which Coningsby dwelt. He was charmed with all that he had seen, wished to see more, Sir Joseph was quite prepared to accompany him, but Lady Wallinger, who seemed to read Coningsby's wishes in his eyes, proposed that the inspection should be general, and in the course of half an hour Coningsby was walking by the side of Edith, and sympathising with all the natural charms to which her quick taste and lively expression called his notice and appreciation. Few things more delightful than a country ramble with a sweet companion, exploring woods, wandering over green commons, loitering in shady lanes, resting on rural stiles, the air full of perfume, the heart full of bliss. It seemed to Coningsby that he had never been happy before. A thrilling joy pervaded his being, he could have sung like a bird. His heart was as sunny as the summer scene. Past and future were absorbed in the flowing hour, not an allusion to Paris, not a speculation on what might arrive, but infinite expressions of agreement, sympathy, a multitude of slight phrases that, however couched, had but one meaning, congeniality. He felt each moment his voice becoming more tender, his heart gushing in soft expressions. Each moment he was more fascinated. Her step was grace, her glance was beauty. Now she touched him by some phrase of sweet simplicity, or carried him spellbound by her airy merriment. Oswald assumed that Coningsby remained to dine with them. There was not even the ceremony of invitation. Coningsby could not but remember his dinner at Millbank, and the timid hostess whom he then addressed so often in vain, as he gazed upon the bewitching and accomplished woman whom he now passionately loved. It was a most agreeable dinner. Oswald, happy in his friend being his guest under his own roof, indulged in unwanted gaiety. The ladies withdrew, Sir Joseph began to talk politics, although the young men had threatened their fair companions immediately to follow them. This was the period of the bedchamber plot, when Sir Robert Peel accepted and resigned power in the course of three days. 
Sir Joseph, who had originally made up his mind to support a conservative government when he deemed it inevitable, had for the last month endeavoured to compensate for this trifling error by vindicating the conduct of his friends and reprobating the behaviour of those who would deprive Her Majesty of the friends of her youth. Sir Joseph was a most chivalrous companion of the friends of her youth principle. Sir Joseph, who was always moderate and conciliatory in his talk, though he would go at any time any length for his party, expressed himself to-day with extreme sobriety, as he was determined not to hurt the feelings of Mr. Coningsby, and he principally confined himself to urging temperate questions, somewhat in the following fashion. I admit that, on the whole, under ordinary circumstances, it would have been more convenient that these appointments should have remained with Sir Robert, but don't you think that under the peculiar circumstances, being friends of Her Majesty's youth, etc., etc.? Sir Joseph was extremely astonished when Coningsby replied that he thought under no circumstances should any appointment in the royal household be dependent on the voice of the House of Commons, though he was far from admiring the friends of her youth principle, which he looked upon as impertinent. But surely, said Sir Joseph, the minister being responsible to Parliament, it must follow that all great offices of state should be filled at his direction. But where do you find this principle of ministerial responsibility? inquired Coningsby. And is not a minister responsible to his sovereign? inquired Millbank. Sir Joseph seemed a little confused. He had always heard that ministers were responsible to Parliament, and he had a vague conviction, notwithstanding the reanimating loyalty of the bedchamber plot, that the sovereign of England was a nonentity. He took refuge in indefinite expressions, and observed, The responsibility of ministers is surely a constitutional doctrine. The ministers of the Crown are responsible to their master. They are not the ministers of Parliament. But then you know, virtually, said Sir Joseph, the Parliament, that is the House of Commons, governs the country. It did before 1832, said Coningsby, but that is all past now. We got rid of that with the Venetian Constitution. The Venetian Constitution, said Sir Joseph. To be sure, said Millbank, we were governed in this country by the Venetian Constitution from the accession of the House of Hanover. But that yoke is past, and now I hope we are in a state of transition from the Italian dogeship to the English monarchy. King, Lords, and Commons, the Venetian Constitution, exclaimed Sir Joseph. But they were phrases, said Coningsby, not facts. The king was a doge, the cabinet the council of ten, your parliament that you call lords and commons was nothing more than the great council of nobles. The resemblance was complete, said Millbank, and no wonder, for it was not accidental. The Venetian constitution was intentionally copied. We should have had the Venetian Republic in 1640, said Coningsby, had it not been for the Puritans. Geneva beat Venice. I am sure these ideas are not very generally known, said Sir Joseph, bewildered. Because you have had your history written by the Venetian party, said Coningsby, and it has been their interest to conceal them. I will venture to say that there are very few men on our side in the House of Commons, said Sir Joseph, who are aware that they were born under a Venetian constitution. Let us go to the ladies, said Millbank, smiling. Edith was reading a letter as they entered. A letter from papa, she exclaimed, looking at her brother with great animation. We may expect him every day, and yet, alas, he cannot fix one. They now all spoke of Millbank and Coningsby was happy that he was familiar with the scene. At length he ventured to say to Edith, "'You once made me a promise which you have never fulfilled. I shall claim it to-night.' "'And what can that be?' "'The song that you promised me at Millbank more than three years ago. Your memory is good. It has dwelt upon the subject.' Then they spoke for a while of other recollections, and then Coningsby appealing to Lady Wallinger for her influence, Edith rose and took up her guitar. 
Her voice was rich and sweet, the air she sang gay, even fantastically frolic, such as the girls of Granada chant trooping home from some country festival. Her soft, dark eye brightened with joyous sympathy, and ever and anon, with an arch grace, she beat the guitar in chorus with her pretty hand. The moon wanes, and Coningsby must leave these enchanted halls. Oswald walked homeward with him until he reached the domain of his grandfather. Then, mounting his horse, Coningsby bade his friend farewell till the morrow, and made his best way to the castle. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 There is a romance in every life. The emblazoned page of Coningsby's existence was now open. It had been prosperous before, with some moments of excitement, some of delight, but they had all found, as it were, their origin in worldly considerations, or been inevitably mixed up with them. At Paris, for example, he loved, or thought he loved, but there not an hour could elapse without his meeting some person, or hearing something, which disturbed the beauty of his emotions, or broke his spellbound thoughts. There was his grandfather hating the Millbanks, or Sidonia loving them, and common people in the common world making common observations on them, asking who they were, or telling who they were, and brushing the bloom off all life's fresh delicious fancies with their coarse handling. But now his feelings were ethereal. He loved passionately, and he loved in a scene and in a society as sweet, as pure, and as refined as his imagination and his heart. There was no malicious gossip, no callous chatter to profane his ear and desecrate his sentiment. All that he heard or saw was worthy of the summer sky, the still green woods, the gushing river, the gardens and terraces, the stately and fantastic dwellings, among which his life now glided as in some dainty and gorgeous mask. All the soft social domestic sympathies of his nature, which, however abundant, had never been cultivated, were developed by the life he was now leading. It was not merely that he lived in the constant presence, and under the constant influence of one whom he adored, that made him so happy. He was surrounded by beings who found felicity in the interchange of kind feelings and kind words, in the cultivation of happy talents and refined tastes, and the enjoyment of a life which their own good sense and their own good hearts made them both comprehend and appreciate. Ambition lost much of its splendour, even his lofty aspirations, something of their hallowing impulse of paramount duty, when Coningsby felt how much ennobling delight was consistent with the seclusion of a private station, and mused over an existence to be passed amid woods and waterfalls, with a fair hand locked in his, or surrounded by his friends in some ancestral hall. The morning after his first visit to Hellingsley, Coningsby rejoined his friends, as he had promised Oswald at their breakfast-table, and day after day he came with the early sun, and left them only when the late moon silvered the keep of Coningsby Castle. Mr. Milbank, who wrote daily, and was daily to be expected, did not arrive. A week, a week of unbroken bliss, had vanished away, passed in long rides and longer walks, sunset saunterings, and sometimes moonlit strolls, talking of flowers, and thinking of things even sweeter, listening to delicious songs, and sometimes reading aloud some bright romance, or some inspiring lay. One day Coningsby, who arrived at the hall unexpectedly late, indeed it was some hours past noon, for he had been detained by dispatches which arrived at the castle from Mr. Rigby, and which required his interposition, found the ladies alone, and was told that Sir Joseph and Oswald were at the fishing cottage, where they wished him to join them. He was in no haste to do this, and Lady Wallinger proposed that when they felt inclined to ramble, they should all walk down to the fishing cottage together. So, seating himself by the side of Edith, who was tinting a sketch which he had made of a rich oriel of Hellingsley, the morning passed away in that slight and yet subtle talk in which a lover delights, and in which, while asking a thousand questions that seem at the first glance sufficiently trifling, he is indeed often conveying a meaning that is not expressed or attempting to discover a feeling that is hidden. 
and these are occasions when glances meet and glances are withdrawn the tongue may speak idly the eye is more eloquent and often more true coningsby looked up lady wallinger who had more than once denounced that she was going to put on her bonnet was gone yet still he continued to talk trifles and still edith listened of all you have told me said edith nothing pleases me so much as your description of st genevieve how much i should like to catch the deer at sunset on the heights what a pretty drawing it would make you would like eustace lyle said coningsby he is so shy and yet so ardent you have such a band of friends oswald was saying this morning that there was no one who had so many devoted friends we are all united by sympathy it is the only bond of friendship and yet friendship edith said lady wallinger looking into the room from the garden with her bonnet on you will find me roaming on the terrace we come dear aunt and yet they did not move there were yet a few pencil touches to be given to the tinted sketch coningsby would cut the pencils would you give me he said some slight memorial of hellingsley and your art i would not venture to hope for anything half so beautiful as this but the slightest sketch it would make me so happy when away to have it hanging in my room a blush suffused the cheek of edith she turned her head a little aside as if she were arranging some drawings and then she said in a somewhat hushed and hesitating voice i am sure i will do so and with pleasure a view of the hall itself i think that would be the best memorial where shall we take it from we will decide in our walk and she rose and promised immediately to return left the room coningsby leant over the mantelpiece in deep abstraction gazing vacantly on a miniature of the father of edith a light step roused him she had returned unconsciously he greeted her with a glance of ineffable tenderness they went forth it was a grey sultry day indeed it was the covered sky which had led to the fishing scheme of the morning sir joseph was an expert and accomplished angler and the darl was renowned for its sport they lingered before they reached the terrace where they were to find lady wallinger observing the different points of view which the hall presented and debating which was to form the subject of coningsby's drawing for already it was to be not merely a sketch but a drawing the most finished that the bright and effective pencil of edith could achieve if it really were to be placed in his room and were to be a memorial of hellingsley her artistic reputation demanded a masterpiece they reached the terrace lady wallinger was not there nor could they observe her in the vicinity coningsby was quite certain that she had gone onward to the fishing cottage and expected them to follow her and he convinced edith of the justness of his opinion to the fishing cottage therefore they bent their steps they emerged from the gardens into the park sauntering over the tableland and seeking as much as possible the shade in the soft but oppressive atmosphere at the limit of the tableland their course lay by a wild but winding path through a gradual and wooded declivity while they were yet in this craggy and romantic woodland the big fervent drops began to fall coningsby urged edith to seek at once a natural shelter but she who knew the country assured him that the fishing cottage was close by and that they might reach it before the rain could do them any harm and truly at this moment emerging from the wood they found themselves in the valley of the darl the river here was narrow and winding but full of life rushing and clear but for the dark sky it reflected with high banks of turf and tall trees the silver birch among all others in clustering groups infinitely picturesque at the turn of the river about two hundred yards distant coningsby observed the low dark roof of the fishing cottage on its banks they descended from the woods to the margin of the stream by a flight of turf and steps coningsby holding edith's hand as he guided her progress the drops became thicker they reached at a rapid pace the cottage the absent boat indicated that sir joseph and oswald were on the river the cottage was an old building of rustic logs with a shelving roof so that you might obtain sufficient shelter without entering its walls coningsby found a rough garden seat for edith the shower was now violent 
Nature, like man, sometimes weeps from gladness. It is the joy and tenderness of her heart that seek relief, and these are summer showers. In this instance the vehemence of her emotion was transient, though the tears kept stealing down her cheek for a long time, and gentle sighs and sobs might for some period be distinguished. The oppressive atmosphere had evaporated, the grey, sullen tint had disappeared, a soft breeze came dancing up the stream, a glowing light fell upon the woods and waters, the perfume of trees and flowers and herbs floated around. There was a caroling of birds, a hum of happy insects in the air, freshness and stir, and a sense of joyous life pervaded all things. It seemed that the heart of all creation was opened. Coningsby, after repeatedly watching the shower with Edith, and speculating on its progress, which did not much annoy them, had seated himself on a log almost at her feet. And assuredly a maiden and a youth more beautiful and engaging had seldom met before in a scene more fresh and fair. Edith, on her rustic seat, watched the now blue and foaming river, and the birch-trees with a livelier tint and quivering in the sunset air. An expression of tranquil bliss suffused her beautiful brow, and spoke from the thrilling tenderness of her soft, dark eye. Coningsby gazed on that countenance with a glance of entranced rapture. His cheek was flushed, his eye gleamed with dazzling luster. She turned her head, she met that glance, and troubled, she withdrew her own. Edith, he said, in a tone of tremulous passion, let me call you Edith. Yes, he continued, gently taking her hand, let me call you my Edith, I love you. She did not withdraw her hand, but turned away a face flushed as the impending twilight. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 it was past the dinner hour when Edith and Coningsby reached the hall, an embarrassing circumstance, but mitigated by the conviction that they had not to encounter a very critical inspection. What then were their feelings when the first servant that they met informed them that Mr. Milbank had arrived? Edith could never have believed that the return of her beloved father to his home could ever have been to her other than a cause of delight, and yet now she trembled when she heard the announcement. The mysteries of love were fast involving her existence. But this was not the season of meditation. Her heart was still agitated by the tremulous admission that she responded to that fervent and adoring love whose eloquent music still sounded in her ear, and the pictures of whose fanciful devotion flitted over her agitated vision. Unconsciously she pressed the arm of Coningsby as the servant spoke and then, without looking into his face, whispering him to be quick, she sprang away. As for Coningsby, notwithstanding the elation of his heart, and the ethereal joy which flowed in all his veins, the name of Mr. Milbank sounded something like a knell. However, this was not the time to reflect. He obeyed the hint of Edith, made the most rapid toilet that ever was consummated by a happy lover, and in a few minutes entered the drawing-room of Hellingsley to encounter the gentleman whom he hoped by some means or other, quite inconceivable, might some day be transformed into his father-in-law, and the fulfilment of his consequent duties towards whom he had commenced by keeping him waiting for dinner. "'How do you do, sir?' said Mr. Milbank, extending his hand to Coningsby. "'You seem to have taken a long walk.' Coningsby looked round to the kind Lady Wallinger, and half addressed his murmured answer to her, explaining how they had lost her and their way, and were caught in a storm or a shower, which, as it terminated about three hours back, and the fishing cottage was a little more than a mile from the hall, very satisfactorily accounted for their not being in time for dinner. Lady Wallinger then said something about the lowering clouds having frightened her from the terrace and Sir Joseph and Oswald talked a little of their sport, and of their having seen an otter. But there was, or at least there seemed to Coningsby, a tone of general embarrassment which distressed him. The fact is, keeping people from dinner under any circumstances is distressing. They are obliged to talk at the very moment when they wish to use their powers of expression for a very different purpose. They are faint, and conversation makes them more exhausted. 
A gentleman, too, fond of his family, who in turn are devoted to him, making a great and inconvenient effort to reach them by dinner-time, to please and surprise them, and finding them all dispersed, dinner so late that he might have reached home in good time without any great inconvenient effort, his daughter, whom he had wished a thousand times to embrace, taking a singularly long ramble with no other companion than a young gentleman whom he did not exactly expect to see. All these are circumstances, individually perhaps slight, and yet, encountered collectively, it may be doubted that they would not a little ruffle even the sweetest temper. Mr. Milbank, too, had not the sweetest temper, though not a bad one, a little quick and fiery, but then he had a kind heart. And when Edith, who had providentially sent down a message to order dinner, entered and embraced him at the very moment that dinner was announced, her father forgot everything in his joy in seeing her, and his pleasure in being surrounded by his friends. He gave his hand to Lady Wallinger, and Sir Joseph led away his niece. Coningsby put his arm around the astonished neck of Oswald, as if they were once more in the playing fields of Eton. "'By Jove, my dear fellow!' he exclaimed. "'I am so sorry we kept your father from dinner.' As Edith headed her father's table, according to his rigid rule, Coningsby was on one side of her. They never spoke so little. Coningsby would have never unclosed his lips had he followed his humour. He was in a stupor of happiness. The dining-room took the appearance of the fishing cottage, and he saw nothing but the flowing river. Lady Wallinger was, however, next to him, and that was a relief, for he felt always she was his friend. Sir Joseph, a good-hearted man, and on subjects with which he was acquainted, full of sound sense, was invaluable to-day, for he entirely kept up the conversation, speaking of things which greatly interested Mr. Milbank. And so their host soon recovered his good temper. He addressed several times his observations to Coningsby, and was careful to take wine with him. On the whole, affairs went on flowingly enough. The gentlemen, indeed, stayed much longer over their wine than on the preceding days, and Coningsby did not venture on the liberty of quitting the room before his host. It was as well. Edith required repose. She tried to seek it on the bosom of her aunt, as she breathed to her the delicious secret of her life. When the gentlemen returned to the drawing-room, the ladies were not there. This rather disturbed Mr. Milbank again. He had not seen enough of his daughter. He wished to hear her sing. But Edith managed to reappear, and even to sing. Then Coningsby went up to her, and asked her to sing the song of the girls of Granada. She said in a low voice, and with a fond yet serious look, I am not in the mood for such a song, but if you wish me... She sang it, and with inexpressible grace, and with an arch vivacity that to a fine observer would have singularly contrasted with the almost solemn and even troubled expression of her countenance a moment afterwards. The day was about to die, the day the most important, the most precious in the lives of Harry Coningsby and Edith Milbank. Words had been spoken, vows breathed, which were to influence their careers for ever. For them hereafter there was to be but one life, one destiny, one world. Each of them was still in such a state of tremulous excitement that neither had found time nor occasion to ponder over the mighty result. They both required solitude, they both longed to be alone. Coningsby rose to depart, he pressed the soft hand of Edith, and his glance spoke his soul. "'We shall see you at breakfast to-morrow, Coningsby,' said Oswald very loud, knowing that the presence of his father would make Coningsby hesitate about coming. Edith's heart fluttered, but she said nothing. It was with delight she heard her father, after a moment's pause, say, "'Oh, I beg we may have that pleasure.' "'Not quite at so early an hour,' said Coningsby, "'but if you will permit me, I hope to have the pleasure of hearing from you to-morrow, sir, that your journey has not fatigued you.' End of chapter 6 
Section 26 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 To be alone, to have no need of feigning a tranquillity he could not feel, of coining commonplace courtesy when his heart was gushing with rapture, this was a great relief to Coningsby, though gained by a separation from Edith. The deed was done. He had breathed his long brooding passion, he had received the sweet expression of her sympathy, he had gained the long coveted heart. Youth, beauty, love, the innocence of unsophisticated breasts, and the inspiration of an exquisite nature, combined to fashion the spell that now entranced his life. He turned to gaze upon the moonlit towers and peaked roofs of Hellingsley. Silent and dreamlike, the picturesque pile rested on its broad terrace, flooded with the silver light, and surrounded by the quaint bowers of its fantastic gardens, tipped with the glittering beam. Half hid in deep shadow, half sparkling in the midnight blaze, he recognized the oriel window that had been the subject of the morning sketch. Almost, he wished, there should be some sound to assure him of his reality but nothing broke the all-pervading stillness. Was his life to be as bright and as tranquil? And what was to be his life? Whither was he to bear the beautiful bride he had gained? Were the portals of Coningsby the proud and hospitable gates that were to greet her? How long would they greet him after the achievement of the last four-and-twenty hours was known to their lord? Was this the return for the confiding kindness of his grandsire? that he should pledge his troth to the daughter of that grandsire's foe? Away with such dark and scaring visions! Is it not the noon of a summer night fragrant with the breath of gardens, bright with the beam that lovers love, and soft with the breath of Ausonian breezes? Within that sweet and stately residence dwells there not a maiden fair enough to revive chivalry, who is even now thinking of him as she leans on her pensive hand, or if perchance she dream, recalls him in her visions? And himself, is he one who would cry craven with such a lot? What avail his golden youth, his high blood, his daring and devising spirit, and all his stores of wisdom, if they help not now? Does not he feel the energy divine that can confront fate and carve out fortunes? Besides, it is nigh Midsummer Eve, and what should fairies reign for but to aid such a bright pair as this? He recalls a thousand times the scene, the moment, in which but a few hours passed he dared to tell her that he loved. He recalls a thousand times the still small voice that murmured her agitated felicity. More than a thousand times, for his heart clenched the idea as a diver grasps a gem, he recalls the enraptured yet gentle embrace that had sealed upon her blushing cheek his mystical and delicious sovereignty. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The morning broke, lowering and thunderous. Small white clouds, dull and immovable, studded the leaden sky. The waters of the rushing darl seemed to have become black and almost stagnant. The terraces of Hellingsley looked like the hard lines of a model, and the mansion itself had a harsh and metallic character. Before the chief portal of his hall, the elder Millbank, with an air of some anxiety, surveyed the landscape of the heavens as if he were speculating on the destiny of the day. Often his eye wandered over the park, often with an uneasy and restless step he paced the raised walk before him. The clock of Hellingsley Church had given the chimes of noon. His son and Coningsby appeared at the end of one of the avenues. His eye lightened. His lip became compressed. He advanced to meet them. "'Are you going to fish today, Oswald?' he inquired of his son. "'We had some thoughts of it, sir.' "'A fine day for sport, I should think,' he observed, as he turned towards the hall with them. Coningsby remarked the fanciful beauty of the portal, its twisted columns and caryatids carved in dark oak. "'Yes, it's very well,' said Millbank, "'but I really do not know why I came here. My presence is an effort. 
Oswald does not care for the place. None of us do, I believe. Oh, I like it now, father, and Edith dotes on it. She was very happy at Millbank, said the father, rather sharply. We are all of us happy at Millbank, said Oswald. I was much struck with the valley and the whole settlement when I first saw it, said Coningsby. Suppose you go and see about the tackle, Oswald, said Mr. Millbank, and Mr. Coningsby and I will take a stroll on the terrace in the meantime. The habit of obedience, which was supreme in this family, instantly carried Oswald away, though he was rather puzzled why his father should be so anxious about the preparation of the fishing tackle, as he rarely used it. His son had no sooner departed than Mr. Millbank turned to Coningsby, and said very abruptly, "'You have never seen my own room here, Mr. Coningsby. Step in, for I wish to say a word to you.' And thus speaking, he advanced before the astonished and rather agitated Coningsby, and led the way through a door and long passage to a room of moderate dimensions, partly furnished as a library, and full of parliamentary papers and blue books. Shutting the door with some earnestness and pointing to a chair, he begged his guest to be seated. Both in their chairs, Mr. Millbank, clearing his throat, said, without preface, I have reason to believe, Mr. Coningsby, that you are attached to my daughter. I have been attached to her for a long time, most ardently, replied Coningsby, in a calm and rather measured tone, but looking very pale. And I have reason to believe that she returns your attachment, said Mr. Millbank. I believe she deigns not to disregard it, said Coningsby, his white cheek becoming scarlet. It is then a mutual attachment, which, if cherished, must produce mutual unhappiness, said Mr. Millbank. I would fain believe the reverse, said Coningsby. Why? inquired Mr. Millbank. Because I believe she possesses every charm, quality, and virtue that can bless man, and because, though I make her no equivalent return, I have a heart, if I know myself, that would struggle to deserve her. I know you to be a man of sense. I believe you to be a man of honour, replied Mr. Millbank. As the first, you must feel that a union between you and my daughter is impossible. What then should be your duty as a man of correct principle is obvious. I could conceive that our union might be attended with difficulties, said Coningsby, in a somewhat deprecating tone. Sir, it is impossible, repeated Mr. Millbank, interrupting him, though not with harshness. That is to say, there is no conceivable marriage which could be effected at greater sacrifices and which would occasion greater misery. The sacrifices are more apparent to me than the misery, said Coningsby, and even they may be imaginary. The sacrifices and the misery are certain and inseparable, said Mr. Millbank. Come now, see how we stand. I speak without reserve, for this is a subject which cannot permit misconception, but with no feelings towards you, sir, but fair and friendly ones. You are the grandson of my lord Monmouth, at present enjoying his favour, but dependent on his bounty. You may be the heir of his wealth to-morrow, and to-morrow you may be the object of his hatred and persecution. Your grandfather and myself are foes, bitter, irreclaimable to the death. It is idle to mince phrases. I do not vindicate our mutual feelings. I may regret that they have ever arisen. I may regret it especially at this exigency. They are not the feelings of good Christians. They may be altogether to be deplored and unjustifiable. But they exist, mutually exist, and have not been confined to words. Lord Monmouth would crush me, had he the power, like a worm, and I have curbed his proud fortunes often. Were it not for this feeling, I should not be here. I purchased this estate merely to annoy him, as I have done a thousand other acts merely for his discomfiture and mortification. In our long encounter I have done him infinitely more injury than he could do me. I have been on the spot. I am active, vigilant, the maker of my fortunes. He is an Epicurean, continually in foreign parts, obliged to leave the fulfilment of his will to others. 
but for these very reasons his hate is more intense. I can afford to hate him less than he hates me. I have injured him more. Here are feelings to exist between human beings, but they do exist, and now you are to go to this man and ask his sanction to marry my daughter? But I would appease these hatreds, I would allay these dark passions, the origins of which I know not, but which never could justify the end, and which lead to so much misery. I would appeal to my grandfather, I would show him Edith. He has looked upon as fair even as Edith, said Mr. Milbank, rising suddenly from his seat and pacing the room, and did that melt his heart? The experience of your own lot should have guarded you from the perils that you have so rashly meditated encountering, and the misery which you have been preparing for others besides yourself. Is my daughter to be treated like your mother, and by the same hand? Your mother's family were not Lord Monmouth's foes. They were simple and innocent people, free from all the bad passions of our nature, and ignorant of the world's ways. But because they were not noble, because they could trace no mystified descent from a foreign invader, or the sacrilegious minion of some spoliating despot, their daughter was hunted from the family which should have exulted to receive her, and the land of which she was the native ornament. Why should a happier lot await you than fell to your parents? You are in the same position as your father, you meditate the same act, the only difference being aggravating circumstances in your case, which, even if I were a member of the same order as my Lord Monmouth, would prevent the possibility of a prosperous union. Marry Edith, and you blast all the prospects of your life, and entail on her a sense of unceasing humiliation. Would you do this? Should I permit you to do this? Coningsby, with his head resting on his arm, his face a little shaded, his eyes fixed on the ground, listened in silence. There was a pause, broken by Coningsby, as in a low voice, without changing his posture or raising his glance, he said, "'It seems, sir, that you were acquainted with my mother.' "'I knew sufficient of her,' replied Mr. Milbank, with a kindling cheek, "'to learn the misery that a woman may entail on herself by marrying out of her condition.' I have bred my children in a respect for their class, I believe they have imbibed my feeling, though it is strange how in the commerce of the world chance in their friendships has apparently baffled my designs. Oh, do not say it is chance, sir, said Coningsby, looking up and speaking with much fervour. The feelings that animate me towards your family are not the feelings of chance, they are the creation of sympathy tried by time, tested by thought. And must they perish? Can they perish? They were inevitable. They are indestructible. Yes, sir, it is vain to speak of the enmities that are fostered between you and my grandfather. The love that exists between your daughter and myself is stronger than all your hatreds. You speak like a young man, and a young man that is in love, said Mr. Milbank. This is mere rhapsody. It will vanish in an instant before the reality of life. And you have arrived at that reality, he continued, speaking with emphasis, leaning over the back of his chair, and looking steadily at Coningsby with his grey, sagacious eye. My daughter and yourself can meet no more. It is impossible you can be so cruel, exclaimed Coningsby. So kind, kind to you both, for I wish to be kind to you as well as to her. You are entitled to kindness from us all, though I will tell you now that years ago, when the news arrived that my son's life had been saved, and had been saved by one who bore the name of Coningsby, I had a presentiment, great as was the blessing, that it might lead to unhappiness. I can answer for the misery of one, said Coningsby, in a tone of great despondency, I feel as if my son were set. Oh, why should there be such wretchedness? Why are there family hatreds and party feuds? Why am I the most wretched of men? My good young friend, you will live, I doubt not, to be a happy one. Happiness is not, as we are apt to fancy, entirely dependent on these contingencies. 
It is the lot of most men to endure what you are suffering, and they can look back to such conjunctures through the vista of years with calmness. I may see Edith now? Frankly, I should say no. My daughter is in her room. I have had some conversation with her. Of course she suffers not less than yourself. To see her again will only aggravate woe. You leave under this roof, sir, some sad memories, but no unkind ones. It is not likely that I can serve you, or that you may want my aid, but whatever may be in my power, remember you may command it, without reserve and without restraint. If I control myself now, it is not because I do not respect your affliction, but because in the course of my life I have felt too much not to be able to command my feelings. You never could have felt what I feel now, said Coningsby, in a tone of anguish. You touch on delicate ground, said Millbank, yet from me you may learn to suffer. There was a being once, not less fair than the peerless girl that you would fain call your own, and her heart was my proud possession. There were no family feuds to baffle our union, nor was I dependent on anything but the energies which had already made me flourishing. What happiness was mine! It was the first dream of my life, and it was the last, my solitary passion, the memory of which softens my heart. Ah, you dreaming scholars and fine gentlemen who saunter through life, you think there is no romance in the loves of a man who lives in the toil and turmoil of business. You are in deep error. Amid my career of travail, there was ever a bright form which animated exertion, inspired my invention, nerved my energy, and to gain whose heart and life I first made many of those discoveries, and entered into many of those speculations, that have since been the foundation of my wide prosperity. Her faith was pledged to me, I lived upon her image, the day was even talked of when I should bear her to the home that I had proudly prepared for her. Then came a young noble, a warrior who had never seen war, glittering with gewgaws. He was quartered in the town where the mistress of my heart, who was soon to share my life and my fortunes, resided. The tale is too bitter not to be brief. He saw her, he sighed, I will hope that he loved her. She gave him with rapture the heart which perhaps she found she had never given to me and instead of bearing the name I had once hoped to have called her by, she pledged her faith at the altar to one who, like you, was called Coningsby. My mother! You see, I too have had my griefs. Dear sir, said Coningsby, rising and taking Mr. Milbank's hand, I am most wretched, and yet I wish to part from you even with affection. You have explained circumstances that have long perplexed me. A curse, I fear, is on our families. I have not mind enough at this moment even to ponder on my situation. My head is a chaos. I go, yes, I quit this Hellingsley, where I came to be so happy, where I have been so happy. Nay, let me go, dear sir. I must be alone. I must try to think. And tell her, no, tell her nothing. God will guard over us. Proceeding down the avenue with a rapid and distempered step, his countenance lost, as it were, in a wild abstraction, Coningsby encountered Oswald Millbank. He stopped, collected his turbulent thoughts, and throwing on Oswald one look that seemed at the same time to communicate woe and to demand sympathy, flung himself into his arms. "'My friend!' he exclaimed and then added in a broken voice, I need a friend. Then, in a hurried, impassioned, and somewhat incoherent strain, leaning on Oswald's arm, as they walked on together, he poured forth all that had occurred, all of which he had dreamed, his baffled bliss, his actual despair. Alas, there was little room for solace, and yet all that earnest affection could inspire, and a sagacious brain and a brave spirit, were offered for his support, if not his consolation, by the friend who was devoted to him. In the midst of this deep communion, teeming with every thought and sentiment that could enchain and absorb the spirit of man, 
They came to one of the park gates of Coningsby. Millbank stopped. The command of his father was peremptory that no member of his family under any circumstances or for any consideration should set his foot on that domain. Lady Wallinger had once wished to have seen the castle, and Coningsby was only too happy in the prospect of escorting her and Edith over the place, but Oswald had then at once put his veto on the project as a thing forbidden, and which, if put in practice, his father would never pardon. So it passed off, and now Oswald himself was at the gates of that very domain with his friend who was about to enter them, his friend whom he might never see again, that Coningsby who, from their boyish days, had been the idol of his life, whom he had lived to see appeal to his affections and his sympathy, and whom Oswald was now going to desert in the midst of his lonely and unsolaced woe. "'I ought not to enter here,' said Oswald, holding the hand of Coningsby, as he hesitated to advance. "'And yet there are duties more sacred even than obedience to a father. I cannot leave you thus, friend of my best heart.' The morning passed away in unceasing yet fruitless speculation on the future. One moment something was to happen, the next nothing could occur. Sometimes a beam of hope flashed over the fancy of Coningsby, and jumping up from the turf on which they were reclining, he seemed to exult in his renovated energies. And then this sanguine paroxysm was succeeded by a fit of depression so dark and dejected that nothing but the presence of Oswald seemed to prevent Coningsby from flinging himself into the waters of the Darl. The day was fast declining, and the inevitable moment of separation was at hand. Oswald wished to appear at the dinner-table of Hellingsley, that no suspicion might arise in the mind of his father of his having accompanied Coningsby home. But just as he was beginning to mention the necessity of his departure, a flash of lightning seemed to transfix the heavens. The sky was very dark, though studied here and there with dingy spots. The young man sprang up at the same time. "'We had better get out of these trees,' said Oswald. "'We had better get to the castle,' said Coningsby. A clap of thunder that seemed to make the park quake broke over their heads, followed by some thick drops. The castle was close at hand. Oswald had avoided entering it, but the impending storm was so menacing that, hurried on by Coningsby, he could make no resistance, and in a few minutes the companions were watching the tempest from the windows of a room in Coningsby Castle. The forked lightning flashed and scintillated from every quarter of the horizon, the thunder broke over the castle as if the keep were rocking with artillery. Amid the momentary pauses of the explosion, the rain was heard descending like dissolving water-spouts. Nor was this one of those transient tempests that often agitate the summer. Time advanced, and its fierceness was little mitigated. Sometimes there was a lull, though the violence of the rain never appeared to diminish. But then, as in some pitched fight between contending hosts, when the fervour of the field seems for a moment to allay, fresh squadrons arrive and renew the hottest strife, so that a low moaning wind, that was now at intervals faintly heard, bore up a great reserve of electric vapour that formed, as it were, into the field in the space between the castle and Hellingsley, and then discharged its violence on that fated district. Coningsby and Oswald exchanged looks. "'You must not think of going home at present, my dear fellow,' said the first. "'I am sure your father would not be displeased. There is not a being here who even knows you, and if they did, what then?' The servant entered the room and inquired whether the gentlemen were ready for dinner. "'By all means. Come, my dear Millbank. I feel reckless as the tempest. Let us drown our cares in wine.' Coningsby, in fact, was exhausted by all the agitation of the day, and all the harassing spectres of the future. He found wine a momentary solace. He ordered the servants away, and for a moment felt a degree of wild satisfaction in the company of the brother of Edith. Thus they sat for a long time, talking only of one subject, and repeating almost the same things, yet both felt happier in being together. Oswald had risen, and, opening the window, examined the approaching night. 
The storm had lulled, though the rain still fell. In the west was a streak of light. In a quarter of an hour he calculated on departing. As he was watching the wind, he thought he heard the sound of wheels, which reminded him of Coningsby's promise to lend him a light carriage for his return. They sat down once more. They had filled their glasses for the last time, to pledge to their faithful friendship and the happiness of Coningsby and Edith, when the door of the room opened and there appeared Mr. Rigby. End of chapter 8 End of book 7《セクション27of Coningsby or the New Generation》by Benjamin Disraeli。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Book 8, Chapter 1 It was the heart of the London season, nearly four years ago, twelve months having almost elapsed since the occurrence of those painful passages at Hellingsley which closed the last book of this history, and long lines of carriages an hour before midnight up to the classic mount of st james and along piccadilly intimated that the world were received as some grand entertainment in arlington street it was the town mansion of the noble family beneath whose roof of beaumanoir we have more than once introduced the reader to gain whose courtyard was at this moment the object of emulous coachmen and to enter whose saloons was to reward the martyr-like patience of their lords and ladies among the fortunate who had already succeeded in bowing to their hostess were two gentlemen who ensconced in a good position surveyed the scene and made their observations on the passing guests they were gentlemen who to judge from their general air and their great consideration with which they were treated by those who were occasionally in their vicinity were personages whose criticism bore authority i say jemmy said the eldest a dandy who had dined with the regent, but who was still a dandy, and who enjoyed life almost as much as in the days when Carlton House occupied the terrace which still bears its name. I say, Jemmy, what a load of young fellows there are. Don't know their names at all. Begin to think fellows are younger than they used to be. Amazing load of young fellows, indeed. At this moment, an individual who came under the fortunate designation of a young fellow but whose assured carriage hardly intimated that this was his first season in London, came up to the junior of the two critics and said, "'A pretty turn you played us yesterday at White's, Melton. We waited dinner nearly an hour.' "'My dear fellow, I am infinitely sorry, but I was obliged to go down to Windsor, and I missed the return train. A good dinner? Who had you?' "'A capital party. Only you were wanted.' We had Beaumanoir and Vere and Jack Tufton and Sprague. Was Sprague's rich? Wasn't he? I have not done laughing yet. He told us a story about the little Biron who was over here last year. I knew her at Paris and an Indian screen. Killing. Get him to tell it you. The richest thing you ever heard. Who's your friend? inquired Mr. Melton's companion as the young man moved away. Sir Charles Buckhurst. Ah, that is Sir Charles Buckhurst. Glad to have seen him. They say he is going it. He knows what he is about. He gad, so they all do. A young fellow now of two or three and twenty knows the world as men used to do after as many years of scrapes. I wonder where there is such a thing as a greenhorn. Effie Crabbe says the reason he gives up his house is that he has cleaned out the old generation, and that the new generation would clean him. Buckhurst is not in that sort of way. He swears by Henry Sidney, a younger son of the Duke, whom you don't know, and young Coningsby, a sort of new set, new ideas and all that sort of thing. Beau tells me a good deal about it, and when I was staying with the Everinghams at Easter, they were full of it. Coningsby had just returned from his travels, and they were quite on the qui vive. Lady Everingham is one of their set. I don't know what it is exactly, but I think we shall hear more of it. A sort of animal magnetism, or unknown tongues, I take it from your description, said his companion. 
"'Well, I don't know what it is,' said Mr. Melton, "'but it has got hold of all the young fellows who have just come out. Beau is a little bit himself. I had some idea of giving my mind to it. They made such a fuss about it at Everingham, but it requires a devilish deal of history, I believe, and all that sort of thing.' "'Ah, that's a bore,' said his companion. "'It is difficult to turn to with a new thing "'when you are not in the habit of it. "'I never could manage charades.' "'Mr. Ormsby, passing by, stopped. "'They told me you had the gout, Cassillis,' "'he said to Mr. Melton's companion. "'So I had, but I have found a fellow "'who cures the gout instanter. "'Tom Needham sent him to me, "'a German fellow, pumice-stone pills, "'sort of a charm, I believe, "'and all that kind of thing.' They say it rubs the gout out of you. I sent him to Luxborough, who was very bad. Cured him directly. Luxborough swears by him. But there's a new thing that Melton has been telling me of, that all the world is going to believe in, said Mr. Cassillis. Something patronised by Lady Everingham. A very good patroness, said Mr. Ormsby. Have you heard anything about it? continued Mr. Cassillis. Young Coningsby brought it from abroad. "'Didn't you say so, Jemmy?' "'No, no, my dear fellow. "'It is not at all that sort of thing.' "'But they say it requires a deuce deal of history,' "'continued Mr. Cassillis. "'One must brush up one's goldsmith. "'Canterton used to be the fellow for history at White's. "'He was always boring one with William the Conqueror, "'Julius Caesar, and all that sort of thing.' "'I tell you what,' said Mr. Ormsby, "'looking both sly and solemn, I should not be surprised if some day or another we have a history about Lady Everingham and young Coningsby. Pooh, said Mr. Melton, he's engaged to be married to her sister, Lady Theresa. The deuce, said Mr. Ormsby. Well, you are a friend of the family, and I suppose you know. He is a devilish good-looking fellow, that young Coningsby, said Mr. Cassillis. All the women are in love with him, they say. Lady Eleanor Ducey quite raves about him. "'By the by, his grandfather has been very unwell,' said Mr. Ormsby, looking mysteriously. "'I saw Lady Monmouth here just now,' said Mr. Melton. "'Oh, he is quite well again,' said Mr. Ormsby. "'Got an odd story at White's that Lord Monmouth was going to separate from her,' said Mr. Cassillis. "'No foundation,' said Mr. Ormsby, shaking his head. "'They are not going to separate, I believe,' said Mr. Melton, "'but I rather think there was a foundation for the rumour. Mr. Ormsby still shook his head. "'Well,' continued Mr. Melton, "'all I know is that it was looked upon last winter at Paris as a settled thing.' "'There was some story about some Hungarian,' said Mr. Cassillis. "'No, that blew over,' said Mr. Melton. "'It was Trautsmandorf the row was about.' All this time Mr. Ormsby, as the friend of Lord and Lady Monmouth, remained shaking his head, but as a member of society, and therefore delighting in small scandal, appropriating the gossip with the greatest avidity. "'I should think old Monmouth was not the sort of fellow to blow up a woman,' said Mr. Cassillis. "'Provided she would leave him quietly,' said Mr. Melton." "'Yes, Lord Monmouth never could live with a woman more than two years,' said Mr. Ormsby pensively. "'And that, I thought at the time, rather an objection to his marriage.' We must now briefly revert to what befell our hero after those unhappy occurrences in the midst of whose first woe we left him. The day after the arrival of Mr. Rigby at the castle, Coningsby quitted it for London, and before a week had elapsed had embarked for Cadiz. He felt a romantic interest in visiting the land to which Edith owed some blood, and in acquiring the language which he had often admired as she spoke it. A favourable opportunity permitted him in the autumn to visit Athens and the Aegean, which he much desired. In the pensive beauties of that delicate land, where perpetual autumn seems to reign, Coningsby found solace. There is something in the character of Grecian scenery which blends with the humour of the melancholy and the feelings of the sorrowful. Coningsby passed his winter at Rome. The wish of his grandfather had rendered it necessary for him to return to England somewhat abruptly. 
Lord Monmouth had not visited his native country since his marriage, but the period that had elapsed since that event had considerably improved the prospects of his party. The majority of the Whig cabinet in the House of Commons by 1840 had become little more than nominal, and though it was circulated among their friends, as if from the highest authority, that one was enough, there seemed daily a better chance of their being deprived even of that magical unit. For the first time in the history of this country, since the introduction of the system of parliamentary sovereignty, the government of England depended on the fate of single elections, and indeed by a single vote, it is remarkable to observe the fate of the Whig government was ultimately decided. This critical state of affairs, duly reported to Lord Monmouth, revived his political passions and offered him that excitement which he was ever seeking, and yet for which he had often sighed. The Marquis, too, was weary of Paris. Every day he found it more difficult to be amused. Lucretia had lost her charm. He, from whom nothing could be concealed, perceived that often, while she elaborately attempted to divert him, her mind was wandering elsewhere. Lord Monmouth was quite superior to all petty jealousy and the vulgar feelings of inferior mortals, but his sublime selfishness required devotion. He had calculated that a wife or a mistress who might be in love with another man, however powerfully their interests might prompt them, could not be so agreeable or amusing to their friends and husbands as if they had no such distracting hold upon their hearts or their fancy. Latterly at Paris, while Lucretia became each day more involved in the vortex of society where all admired and some adored her, Lord Monmouth fell into the easy habit of dining in his private rooms, sometimes tete-a-tete -tete with Villebecque, whose inexhaustible tales and adventures about a kind of society which Lord Monmouth had always preferred infinitely to the polished and somewhat insipid circles in which he was born, had rendered him the prime favourite of his great patron. Sometimes Villebecque, too, brought a friend, male or otherwise, whom he thought invested with the rare faculty of distraction. Lord Monmouth cared not who or what they were, provided they were diverting. Villebecque had written to Coningsby at Rome, by his grandfather's desire, to beg him to return to England and meet Lord Monmouth there. The letter was couched with all the respect and good feeling which Villebecque really entertained for him whom he addressed. Still, a letter on such a subject, from such a person, was not agreeable to Coningsby, and his reply to it was direct to his grandfather. Lord Monmouth, however, had entirely given over writing letters. Coningsby had met at Paris, on his way to England, Lord and Lady Everingham, and he had returned with them. This revival of an old acquaintance was both agreeable and fortunate for our hero. The vivacity of a clever and charming woman pleasantly disturbed the brooding memory of Coningsby. There is no mortification, however keen, no misery, however desperate, which the spirit of woman cannot in some degree lighten or alleviate. About, too, to make his formal entrance into the great world, he could not have secured a more valuable and accomplished female friend. She gave him every instruction, every intimation that was necessary, cleared the social difficulties which in some degree are experienced on their entrance into the world even by the most highly connected, unless they have this benign assistance, planted him immediately in the position which was expedient, took care that he was invited at once to the right houses, and, with the aid of her husband, that he should become a member of the right clubs. "'And who is to have the blue ribbon, Lord Eskdale?' said the Duchess to that nobleman, as he entered and approached to pay his respects. "'If I were Melbourne, I would keep it open,' replied his lordship. "'It is a mistake to give away too quickly.' "'But suppose they go out,' said her grace. "'Oh, there is always a last day to clear the house. But they will be in another year. The cliff will not be sapped before then. We made a mistake last year about the ladies.' I know you always thought so. Quarrels about women are always a mistake. One should make it a rule to give up to them, and then they are sure to give up to us. You have no great faith in our firmness? 
Male firmness is very often obstinacy. Women have always something better, worth all qualities. They have tact. A compliment to the sex from so finished a critic as Lord Eskdale is appreciated. But at this moment the arrival of some guests terminated the conversation, and Lord Eskdale moved away and approached a group which Lady Everingham was enlightening. "'My dear Lord Fitz Booby, her ladyship observed, "'in politics we require faith as well as in all other things.' Lord Fitz Booby looked rather perplexed, but possessed of considerable official experience, having held high posts, some in the cabinet, for nearly a quarter of a century, he was too versed to acknowledge that he had not understood a single word that had been addressed to him for the last ten minutes. He looked on with the same grave, attentive stolidity, occasionally nodding his head, as he was wont of yore when he received a deputation on sugar duties or joint-stock banks, and when he made, as was his custom, when particularly perplexed, an occasional note on a sheet of foolscap paper. "'An opposition in an age of revolution,' continued Lady Everingham, "'must be founded on principles. "'It cannot depend on mere personal ability and party address, "'taking advantage of circumstances. "'You have not enunciated a principle for the last ten years, "'and when you seemed on the point of acceding to power, "'it was not on a great question of national interest, "'but a technical dispute respecting the constitution "'of an exhausted sugar colony.' "'If you are a Conservative party, we wish to know what you want to conserve,' said Lord Vere. "'If it had not been for the Whig abolition of slavery,' said Lord Fitzbooby, goaded into repartee, "'Jamaica would not have been an exhausted sugar colony.' "'Then what you do want to conserve is slavery?' said Lord Vere. "'No,' said Lord Fitzbooby, "'I am never for retracing our steps.' "'But will you advance? Will you move?' "'And where will you advance, and how will you move?' said Lady Everingham. "'I think we have had quite enough of advancing,' said his lordship. "'I had no idea your ladyship was a member of the movement party,' he added, with a sarcastic grin. "'But if it were bad, Lord Fitzbooby, to move where we are, as you and your friends have always maintained, how can you reconcile it to principle to remain there?' said Lord Vere. "'I would make the best of a bad bargain,' said Lord Fitzbooby. "'With a Conservative government, a reform constitution would be less dangerous.' "'Why?' said Lady Everingham. "'What are your distinctive principles that render the peril less?' "'I appeal to Lord Eskdale,' said Lord Fitzbooby. "'There is Lady Everingham turned quite a radical, I declare. "'Is not your lordship of opinion that the country must be safer "'with a Conservative government than with a Liberal?' "'I think the country is always tolerably secure,' said Lord Eskdale. Lady Theresa, leaning on the arm of Mr. Lyle, came up at this moment, and unconsciously made a diversion in favour of Lord Fitzbooby. "'Pray, Theresa, said Lady Everingham, "'where is Mr. Coningsby?' "'Let us endeavour to ascertain. "'It so happened that on this day Coningsby and Henry Sidney dined at Grillian's, at the university club, where, among many friends whom Coningsby had not met for a long time, and among delightful reminiscences, the unconscious hours stole on. It was late when they quitted Grillian's, and Coningsby's broom was detained for a considerable time before its driver could insinuate himself into the line, which indeed he never would have succeeded in doing, had he not fortunately come across the coachman of the Duke of Agincourt who, being of the same politics as himself, belonging to the same club, and always blackballing the same men, let him in from a legitimate party feeling. So they arrived in Arlington Street at a very late hour. Coningsby was springing up the staircase, now not so crowded as it had been, and met a retiring party. He was about to say a passing word to a gentleman as he went by, when suddenly Coningsby turned deadly pale. The gentleman could hardly be the cause, for it was the gracious and handsome presence of Lord Beaumanoir. The lady, resting on his arm, was Edith. They moved on while he was motionless, yet Edith and himself had exchanged glances. His was one of astonishment, but what was the expression of hers? 
she must have recognized him before he had observed her she was collected and she expressed the purpose of her mind in a distant and haughty recognition coningsby remained for a moment stupefied then suddenly turning back he bounded downstairs and hurried into the cloak-room he met lady wallinger he spoke rapidly he held her hand did not listen to her answers his eyes wandered about there were many persons present at length he recognized edith enveloped in her mantle he went forward he looked at her as if he would have read her soul he said something she changed colour as he addressed her but seemed instantly by an effort to rally and regain her equanimity replied to his inquiries with extreme brevity and lady wallinger's carriage being announced moved away with the same slightly haughty salute as before on the arm of lord beaumanoir chapter two sadness fell over the once happy family of millbank after the departure of coningsby from hellingsley when the first pang was over edith had found some solace in the sympathy of her aunt who had always appreciated and admired coningsby but it was a sympathy which aspired only to soften sorrow and not to create hope but lady wallinger though she lengthened her visit for the sake of her niece in time quitted them and then the name of coningsby was never heard by edith her brother shortly after the sorrowful and abrupt departure of his friend had gone to the factories where he remained and of which in future it was intended that he should assume the principal direction mr millbank himself sustained at first by the society of his friend sir joseph to whom he was attached and occupied with daily reports from his establishment and the transaction of affairs with his numerous and busy constituents was for a while scarcely conscious of the alteration which had taken place in the demeanour of his daughter but when they were once more alone together it was impossible any longer to be blind to the great change that happy and equable gaiety of spirit which seemed to spring from an innocent enjoyment of existence and which had ever distinguished edith was wanting her sunny glance was gone she was not indeed always moody and dispirited but she was fitful unequal in her tone that temper whose sweetness had been a domestic proverb had become a little uncertain not that her affection for her father was diminished but there were snatches of unusual irritability which momentarily escaped her followed by bursts of tenderness that were the creatures of compunction and often after some hasty word she would throw her arms round her father's neck with the fondness of remorse she pursued her usual avocations for she had really too well regulated a mind she was in truth a person of too strong an intellect to neglect any source of occupation and distraction her flowers her pencil and her books supplied her with these and music soothed and at time beguiled her agitated thoughts but there was no joy in the house and in time mr millbank felt it mr millbank was vexed irritated grieved edith his edith the pride and delight of his existence who had been to him only a source of exultation and felicity was no longer happy was perhaps pining away and there was the appearance the unjust appearance that he her fond father was the cause and occasion of all this wretchedness it would appear that the name of coningsby to which he now owed a great debt of gratitude was still doomed to bear him mortification and misery truly had the young man said that there was a curse upon their two families and yet on reflection it still seemed to mr millbank that he had acted with as much wisdom and real kindness as decision how otherwise was he to have acted the union was impossible the speedier their separation therefore clearly the better unfortunate indeed had been his absence from hellingsley unquestionably his presence might have prevented the catastrophe oswald should have hindered all this and yet mr millbank could not shut his eyes to the devotion of his son to coningsby he felt he could count on no assistance in this respect from that quarter yet how hard upon him that he should seem to figure as a despot or a tyrant to his own children whom he loved 
when he had absolutely acted in an inevitable manner. Edith seemed sad, Oswald sullen, all was changed. All the objects for which this clear-headed, strong-minded, kind-hearted man had been working all his life seemed to be frustrated. And why? Because a young man had made love to his daughter, who was really in no manner entitled to do so. As the autumn drew on, Mr. Milbank found Hellingsley, under existing circumstances, extremely wearisome, and he proposed to his daughter that they should pay a visit to their earlier home. Edith assented without difficulty, but without interest. And yet, as Mr. Milbank immediately perceived, the change was a judicious one, for certainly the spirits of Edith seemed to improve after her return to their valley. There were more objects of interest. Change, too, was always beneficial. If Mr. Milbank had been aware that Oswald had received a letter from Coningsby, written before he quitted Spain, perhaps he might have recognized a more satisfactory reason for the transient liveliness of his daughter, which had so greatly gratified him. About a month after Christmas, the meeting of Parliament summoned Mr. Milbank up to London, and he had wished Edith to accompany him. But London in February to Edith, without friends or connections, her father always occupied and absent from her day and night, seemed to them all, on reflection, to be a life not very conducive to health or cheerfulness, and therefore she remained with her brother. Oswald had heard from Coningsby again from Rome, but at the period he wrote he did not anticipate his return to England. His tone was affectionate, but dispirited. Lady Wallinger went up to London after Easter for the season, and Mr. Milbank, now that there was a constant companion for his daughter, took a house and carried Edith back with him to London. Lady Wallinger, who had great wealth and great tact, had obtained by degrees a not inconsiderable position in society. She had a fine house in a fashionable situation, and gave profuse entertainments. The Whigs were under obligations to her husband, and the great Whig ladies were gratified to find in his wife a polished and pleasing person, to whom they could be courteous without any annoyance, so that Edith, under the auspices of her aunt, found herself at once in circles which otherwise she might not easily have entered, but which her beauty, grace, and experience of the most refined society of the continent qualified her to shine in. One evening they met the Marquis of Beaumanoir, their friend of Rome and Paris, and admirer of Edith, who from that time was seldom from their side. His mother, the Duchess, immediately called both on the Millbanks and the Wallingers, glad not only to please her son, but to express that consideration for Mr. Millbank which the Duke always wished to show. It was, however, of no use. Nothing would induce Mr. Millbank ever to enter what he called aristocratic society. He liked the House of Commons, never paired off, never missed a moment of it, worked at committees all the morning, listened attentively to debates all the night, always dined at Bellamy's when there was a house, and when there was not, like dining at the Fishmonger's Company, the Russia Company, great emigration banquets, and other joint-stock festivities. That was his idea of rational society, business and pleasure combined, a good dinner, and good speeches afterwards. Edith was aware that Coningsby had returned to England, for her brother had heard from him on his arrival, but Oswald had not heard since. A season in London only represented in the mind of Edith the chance, perhaps the certainty of meeting Coningsby again, of communing together over the catastrophe of last summer, of soothing and solacing each other's unhappiness, and perhaps, with the sanguine imagination of youth, foreseeing a more felicitous future. She had been nearly a fortnight in town, and though moving frequently in the same circles as Coningsby, they had not yet met. It was one of those results which could rarely occur, but even chance enters too frequently into the league against lovers. The invitation to the assembly at Blank House was therefore particularly gratifying to Edith, since she could scarcely doubt that if Coningsby were in town, which her casual inquiries of Lord Beaumanoir induced her to believe was the case, he would be present. 
Never, therefore, had she repaired to an assembly with such a flattering spirit, and yet there was a fascinating anxiety about it that bewilders the young heart. In vain Edith surveyed the rooms to catch the form of that being, whom for a moment she had never ceased to cherish and muse over. He was not there, and at the very moment when, disappointed and mortified, she most required solace, she learned from Mr. Melton that Lady Theresa Sidney, whom she chanced to admire, was going to be married, and to Mr. Coningsby. What a revelation! His silence, perhaps his shunning of her, were no longer inexplicable. What a return for all her romantic devotion in her sad solitude at Hellingsley! Was this to be the end of their twilight rambles, and the sweet pathos of their mutual loves? There seemed to be no truth in man, no joy in life. All the feelings that she had so generously lavished, all returned upon herself. She could have burst into a passion of tears, and buried herself in a cloister. Instead of that, civilization made her listen with a serene though tortured countenance. But as soon as it was in her power, pleading a headache to Lady Wallinger, she effected, or thought she had effected, her escape from a scene which harrowed her heart. As for Coningsby, he passed a sleepless night, agitated by the unexpected presence of Edith, and distracted by the manner in which she had received him. To say that her appearance had revived all his passionate affection for her, would convey an unjust impression of the nature of his feelings. His affection had never for a moment swerved. It was profound and firm. But unquestionably this sudden vision had brought before him, in startling and more vivid colours, the relations that subsisted between them. There was the being whom he loved and who loved him, and whatever were the barriers which the circumstances of life placed against their union, they were partakers of the solemn sacrament of an unpolluted heart. Coningsby, as we have mentioned, had signified to Oswald his return to England. He had hitherto omitted to write again, not because his spirit faltered, but he was wearied of whispering hope without foundation, and mourning over his chagrined fortunes. Once more in England, once more placed in communication with his grandfather, he felt an increased conviction the difficulties which surrounded him. The society of Lady Everingham and her sister, who had been at the same time her visitor, had been a relaxation, and a beneficial one, to a mind suffering too much from the tension of one idea. But Coningsby had treated the matrimonial project of his gay-minded hostess with the courteous levity in which he believed it at first half originated. He admired and liked Lady Theresa, but there was a reason why he should not marry her, even had his own heart not been absorbed by one of those passions from which men of deep and earnest character never emancipate themselves. After musing and meditating again and again over everything that had occurred, Coningsby fell asleep when the morning had far advanced, resolved to rise when a little refreshed, and find out Lady Wallinger, who, he felt sure, would receive him with kindness. Yet it was fated that this step should not be taken, for while he was at breakfast his servant brought him a letter from Monmouth House, apprising him that his grandfather wished to see him as soon as possible on urgent business. End of chapter 2《セクション28 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8, Chapter 3. Lord Monmouth was sitting in the same dressing room in which he was first introduced to the reader. On the table were several packets of papers that were open and in course of reference, and he dictated his observations to Monsieur Villebecq, who was writing at his left hand. Thus were they occupied when Coningsby was ushered into the room. "'You see, Harry,' said Lord Monmouth, "'that I am much occupied to-day, yet the business on which I wish to communicate with you 
is so pressing that it could not be postponed. He made a sign to Villebecq, and his secretary instantly retired. I was right in pressing your return to England, continued Lord Monmouth to his grandson, who was a little anxious as to the impending communication, which you could not in any way anticipate. These are not times when young men should be out of sight. Your public career will commence immediately. The government have resolved on a dissolution. My information is from the highest quarter. You may be astonished, but it is a fact. They are going to dissolve their own House of Commons. Notwithstanding this and the Queen's name, we can beat them. But the race requires the finest jockeying. We can't give a point. Tadpole has been here to me about Darlford. He came specially with a message, I may say an appeal, for one to whom I can refuse nothing. The government count on the seat, though with the new registration tis nearly a tie. If we had a good candidate, we could win. But Rigby won't do. He is too much of the old clique, used up, a hack, besides a beaten horse. We are assured the name of Coningsby would be a host. There is a considerable section who support the present fellow who will not vote against a Coningsby. They have thought of you as a fit person, and I have approved of the suggestion. You will, therefore, be the candidate for Darlford with my entire sanction and support, and I have no doubt you will be successful. You may be sure I shall spare nothing, and it will be very gratifying to me, after being robbed of all our boroughs, that the only Coningsby who cares to enter Parliament should nevertheless be able to do so as early as I could fairly desire. Coningsby, the rival of Mr. Milbank, on the hustings of Darlford, vanquished a victorious equally a catastrophe. The fierce passions, the gross insults, the hot blood and the cool lies, the ruffianism and the ribaldry, perhaps the domestic discomfiture and mortification which he was about to be the means of bringing on the roof he loved best in the world, occurred to him with anguish. The countenance of Edith, haughty and mournful last night, rose to him again. He saw her canvassing for her father, and against him. Madness! And for what was he to make this terrible and costly sacrifice? For his ambition? Not even for that divinity or demon for which we all immolate so much. Mighty ambition, forsooth, to succeed to the Rigbys, to enter the House of Commons a slave and a tool, to move according to instructions, and to labour for the low designs of petty spirits, without even the consolation of being a dupe. What sympathy could there exist between Coningsby and the great Conservative Party, that for ten years, in an age of revolution, had never promulgated a principle? whose only intelligible and consistent policy seemed to be an attempt, very grateful, of course, to the feelings of an English royalist, to revive Irish Puritanism, who, when in power in 1835, had used that power only to evince their utter ignorance of church principles, and who were, at this moment, when Coningsby was formally solicited to join their ranks, in open insurrection against the prerogatives of the English monarchy. "'Do you anticipate, then, an immediate dissolution, sir?' inquired Coningsby, after a moment's pause. "'We must anticipate it, though I think it is doubtful. It may be next month, it may be in the autumn, they may tide over another year, as Lord Eskdale thinks, and his opinion always weighs with me. He is very safe.' Tadpole believes they will dissolve at once, but whether they dissolve now, or in a month's time, or in the autumn, or next year, our course is clear. We must declare our intentions immediately. We must hoist our flag. Monday next there is a great conservative dinner at Darlford. You must attend it. That will be the finest opportunity in the world for you to announce yourself. Don't you think, sir, said Coningsby, that such an announcement would be rather premature. It is, in fact, embarking in a contest which may last a year, perhaps more. "'What you say is very true,' said Lord Monmouth. "'No doubt it is very troublesome, very disgusting. Any canvassing is. 
but we must take things as we find them you cannot get into parliament now in the good old gentlemanlike way and we ought to be thankful that this interest has been fostered for our purpose coningsby looked on the carpet cleared his throat as if about to speak and then gave something like a sigh i think you had better be off the day after to-morrow said lord monmouth i have sent instructions to the steward to do all he can in so short a time for i wish you to entertain the principal people you are most kind you are always most kind to me dear sir said coningsby in a hesitating tone and with an air of great embarrassment but in truth i have no wish to enter parliament what said lord monmouth i feel that i am not sufficiently prepared for so great a responsibility as a seat in the house of commons said coningsby responsibility said lord monmouth smiling what responsibility is there how can any one have a more agreeable seat the only person to whom you are responsible is your own relation who brings you in and i don't suppose there can be any difference on any point between us you are certainly still young but i was younger by nearly two years when i first went in and i found no difficulty there can be no difficulty all you have to do is to vote with your party as for speaking if you have a talent that way take my advice don't be in a hurry learn to know the house learn the house to know you if a man be discreet he cannot enter parliament too soon it is not exactly that sir said coningsby then what is it my dear harry you see to-day i have much to do yet as your business is pressing i would not postpone seeing you an hour i thought you would have been very much gratified you mentioned that i had nothing to do but to vote with my party sir replied coningsby you mean of course by that term what is understood by the conservative party of course our friends i am sorry said coningsby rather pale but speaking with firmness i am sorry that i could not support the conservative party by blank exclaimed lord monmouth starting in his seat some woman has got hold of him and made him a whig no my dear grandfather said coningsby scarcely able to repress a smile serious as the interview was becoming nothing of the kind i assure you no person can be more anti-whig i don't know what you are driving at sir said lord monmouth in a hard dry tone i wish to be frank sir said coningsby and i am very sensible of your goodness in permitting me to speak to you on the subject what i mean to say is that i have for a long time looked upon the conservative party as a body who have betrayed their trust more from ignorance i admit than from design yet clearly a body of individuals totally unequal to the exigencies of the epoch and indeed unconscious of its real character you mean giving up those irish corporations said lord monmouth well between ourselves i am quite of the same opinion but we must mount higher we must go to twenty-eight for the real mischief but what is the use of lamenting the past peel is the only man suited to the times and all that at least we must say so and try to believe so we can't go back and it is our own fault that we have let the chief power out of the hands of our own order it was never thought of at the time of your great-grandfather sir and if a commoner were for a season permitted to be the nominal premier to do the detail there was always a secret committee of great sixteen eighty-eight nobles to give him his instructions i should be very sorry to see secret committees of great sixteen eighty-eight nobles again said coningsby that what the devil do you want to see said lord monmouth political faith said coningsby instead of political infidelity hm said lord monmouth before i support conservative principles continued coningsby i merely wish to be informed what those principles aim to conserve it could not appear to be the prerogative of the crown since the principal portion of a conservative oration now is an invective against a late royal act which they describe as a bedchamber plot is it the church which they wish to conserve what is a threatened appropriation clause against an actual church commission in the hands of parliamentary laymen 
Could the Long Parliament have done worse? Well, then, if it is neither the Crown nor the Church, whose rights and privileges this Conservative Party proposed to vindicate, is it your House, the House of Lords, whose powers they are prepared to uphold? Is it not notorious that the very man whom you have elected as your leader in that House declares among his Conservative adherents that henceforth the Assembly that used to furnish those very committees of great revolution nobles that you mention is to initiate nothing, and without a struggle is to subside into that undisturbed repose which resembles the imperial tranquillity that secured the frontiers by paying tribute? All this is vastly fine, said Lord Monmouth, but I see no means by which I can attain my object but by supporting Peel. After all, what is the end of all parties and all politics? To gain your object. I want to turn our coronet into a ducal one, and to get your grandmother's barony called out of abeyance in your favour. It is impossible that Peel can refuse me. I have already purchased an ample estate with a view of entailing it on you and your issue. You will make a considerable alliance. You may marry, if you please, Lady Theresa Sidney. I hear the report with pleasure. Count on my at once entering into any arrangement conducive to your happiness. My dear grandfather, you have ever been to me only too kind and generous. To whom should I be kind but to you, my own blood, that has never crossed me, and of whom I have reason to be proud? Yes, Harry, it gratifies me to hear you admired, and to learn your success. All I want now is to see you in Parliament. A man should be in Parliament early. There is a sort of stiffness about every man, no matter what may be his talents, who enters Parliament late in life, and now, fortunately, the occasion offers. You will go down on Friday, feed the notabilities well, speak out, praise Peel, abuse O'Connell and the ladies of the bedchamber, anathematize all waverers, say a good deal about Ireland, stick to the Irish registration bill, that's a good card. And above all, my dear Harry, don't spare that fellow Milbank. Remember, in turning him out, you not only gained a vote for the Conservative cause at our coronet, but you crush my foe. Spare nothing for that object. I count on you, boy. I should grieve to be backward in anything that concerned your interest or your honour, sir, said Coningsby, with an air of great embarrassment. I am sure you would, I am sure you would, said Lord Monmouth, in a tone of some kindness. And I feel at this moment, continued Coningsby, that there is no personal sacrifice which I am not prepared to make for them except one. My interests, my affections, they should not be placed in the balance, if yours, sir, were at stake, though there are circumstances which might involve me in a position of as much mental distress as a man could well endure. But I claim for my convictions, my dear grandfather, a generous tolerance. I can't follow you, sir said Lord Monmouth, again in his hard tone. Our interests are inseparable, and therefore there can never be any sacrifice of conduct on your part. What you mean by sacrifice of affections, I don't comprehend. But as for your opinions, you have no business to have any other than those I uphold. You are too young to form opinions. I am sure I wish to express them with no unbecoming confidence, replied Coningsby. I have never intruded them on your ear before. But this being an occasion when you yourself said, sir, I was about to commence my public career, I confess I thought it was my duty to be frank. I would not entail on myself long years of mortification by one of those ill-considered entrances into political life which so many public men have cause to deplore. You go with your family, sir, like a gentleman. You are not to consider your opinions like a philosopher or a political adventurer. Yes, sir, said Coningsby, with animation, but men going with their families like gentlemen and losing sight of every principle on which the society of this country ought to be established produced the Reform Bill. Damn the Reform Bill, said Lord Monmouth. If the Duke had not quarrelled with Lord Grey on a coal committee, we should never have had the Reform Bill, and Grey would have gone to Ireland. You are in as great peril now as you were in 1830, said Coningsby. 
"'No, no, no,' said Lord Monmouth. "'The Tory party is organised now. "'They will not catch us napping again. "'These Conservative associations have done the business.' "'But what are they organised for?' said Coningsby. "'At the best, to turn out the Whigs. "'And when you have turned out the Whigs, what then? "'You may get your ducal coronet, sir. "'But a duke now is not so great a man as a baron was but a century back. "'We cannot struggle against the irresistible stream of circumstances. "'Power has left our order. "'This is not an age for factitious aristocracy. "'As for my grandmother's barony, I should look upon the termination of its abeyance in my favour as the act of my political extinction. What we want, sir, is not to fashion new dukes and furbish up old baronies, but to establish great principles which may maintain the realm and secure the happiness of the people. Let me see authority once more honoured, a solemn reverence again the habit of our lives. Let me see property acknowledging, as in the old days of faith, that labour is his twin brother, and that the essence of all tenure is the performance of duty, let results such as these be brought about, and let me participate, however feebly, in the great fulfilment, and public life then indeed becomes a noble career, and a seat in Parliament, an enviable distinction. "'I tell you what it is, Harry,' said Lord Monmouth, very dryly, "'members of this family may think as they like, but they must act as I please. You must go down to Friday to Darlford and declare yourself a candidate for the town, or I shall reconsider our mutual positions. I would say you must go to-morrow, but it is only courteous to Rigby to give him a previous intimation of your movement, and that cannot be done to-day. I sent for Rigby this morning on other business which now occupies me, and find he is out of town. He will return to-morrow, and will be here at three o'clock, when you can meet him. You will meet him, I doubt not, like a man of sense," added Lord Monmouth, looking at Coningsby, with a glance such as he had never before encountered, who is not prepared to sacrifice all the objects of life for the pursuit of some fantastical puerilities. His lordship rang a bell on his table for Villebecq, and to prevent any further conversation, resumed his papers. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 It would have been difficult for any person, unconscious of crime, to have felt more dejected than Coningsby when he rode out of the courtyard of Monmouth House. The love of Edith would have consoled him for the destruction of his prosperity. The proud fulfilment of his ambition might in time have proved some compensation for his crushed affections but his present position seemed to offer no single source of solace. There came over him that irresistible conviction that is at times the dark room of all of us, that the bright period of our life is past, that a future awaits us only of anxiety, failure, mortification, despair, that none of our resplendent visions can ever be realised, and that we add but one more victim to the long and dreary catalogue of baffled aspirations. Nor could he indeed by any combination see the means to extricate himself from the perils that were encompassing him. There was something about his grandfather that defied persuasion. Prone as eloquent youth generally is to believe in the resistless power of its appeals, Coningsby despaired at once of ever moving Lord Monmouth. There had been a callous dryness in his manner, an unswerving purpose in his spirit, that at once baffled all attempts at influence. Nor could Coningsby forget the look he received when he quitted the room. There was no possibility of mistaking it. It said at once, without periphrasis, "'Cross my purpose, and I will crush you.'" This was the moment when the sympathy, if not the counsels of friendship, might have been grateful. A clever woman might have afforded even more than sympathy, some happy device that might have even released him from the mesh in which he was involved. And once Coningsby had turned his horse's head to Park Lane to call on Lady Everingham. But surely, if there were a sacred secret in the world, it was the one which subsisted between himself and Edith. No, that must never be violated. Then there was Lady Wallinger. He could at least speak with freedom to her. 
He resolved to tell her all. He looked in for a moment at a club to take up the court guide and find her direction. A few men were standing in a bow window. He heard Mr. Casilla say, "'So Beau, they say, is booked at last. The new beauty, have you heard?' "'I saw him very sweet on her last night,' rejoined his companion. "'Has she any tin?' "'Deuce deal, they say,' replied Mr. Casillas. "'The father is a cotton lord, and they all have loads of tin, you know. Nothing like them now.' "'He is in Parliament, is not he?' "'Gat, I believe he is,' said Mr. Casillas. I never know who is in Parliament these days. I remember when there were only ten men in the House of Commons who were not either members of books or this place. Everything is so deuced changed. I hear tis an old affair of Beau, said another gentleman. It was all done a year ago at Rome or Paris. They say she refused him then, said Mr. Cassillis. Well, that is tolerably cool for a manufacturer's daughter, said his friend. What next? "'I wonder how the Duke likes it,' said Mr. Cassillis. "'Or the Duchess,' added one of his friends. "'Or the Everinghams,' added the other. "'The Duke will be deuced glad to see Beau settled, I take it,' said Mr. Cassillis. "'A good deal depends on the tin,' said his friend. Coningsby threw down the court guide with a sinking heart. In spite of every insuperable difficulty, Hitherto the end and object of all his aspirations and all his exploits, sometimes even almost unconsciously to himself, was Edith. It was over. The strange manner of last night was fatally explained. The heart that had once been his was now another's. To the man who still loves there is that conviction the most profound and desolate sorrow of which our nature is capable. All the recollection of the past, all the once cherished prospects of the future blend into one bewildering anguish coningsby quitted the club and mounting his horse rode rapidly out of town almost unconscious of his direction he found himself at length in a green lane near williston silent and undisturbed he pulled up his horse and summoned all his mind to the contemplation of his prospects edith was lost now, should he return to his grandfather, accept his mission, and go down to Darlford on Friday? Favour and fortune, power, prosperity, rank, distinction, would be the consequence of this step. Might not he add even vengeance? Was there to be no term to his endurance? Might not he teach this proud, prejudiced manufacturer, with all his virulence and despotic caprices, a memorable lesson? and his daughter, too, this betrothed, after all, of a young noble with her flush futurity of splendour and enjoyment, was she to hear of him only, if indeed she heard of him at all, as of one toiling or trifling in the humbler positions of existence, and wonder with a blush that he could ever have been the hero of her romantic girlhood? What degradation in the idea! His cheek burned at the possibility of such ignominy. It was a conjuncture in his life that required decision. He thought of his companions, who looked up to him with such ardent anticipations of his fame, of delight in his career, and confidence in his leading. Were all these high and fond fancies to be balked? On the very threshold of life was he to blunder? Tis the first step that leads to all, and his was to be a willful error. He remembered his first visit to his grandfather and the delight of his friends at Eton at his report on his return. After eight years of initiation, was he to lose the favour then so highly prized, when the results which they had so long counted on were on the very eve of accomplishment? Parliament and riches and rank and power, these were facts, realities, substances that none could mistake. Was he to sacrifice them for speculations, theories, shadows, perhaps the vapours of a green and conceited brain? No, by heaven, no! He was like Caesar by the starry river's side, watching the image of the planets on his fatal waters. The die was cast. The sun set, the twilight spell fell upon his soul, the exaltation of his spirit died away. Beautiful thoughts, full of sweetness and tranquillity and consolation, 
came clustering round his heart like seraphs. He thought of Edith in her hours of fondness. He thought of the pure and solemn moments when to mingle his name with the heroes of humanity was his aspiration, and to achieve immortal fame the inspiring purpose of his life. What were the tawdry accidents of vulgar ambition to him? No domestic despot could deprive him of his intellect, his knowledge, the sustaining power of an unpolluted conscience. If he possessed the intelligence in which he had confidence, the world would recognize his voice even if not placed upon a pedestal. If the principles of his philosophy were true, the great heart of the nation would respond to their expression. Coningsby felt at this moment a profound conviction which never again deserted him, that the conduct which would violate the affections of his heart, or the dictates of the conscience, however it may lead to immediate success, is a fatal error. Conscious that he was perhaps verging on some painful vicissitude of his life, he devoted himself to a love that seemed hopeless, and to a fame that was perhaps a dream. It was under the influence of these solemn resolutions that he wrote, on his return home, a letter to Lord Monmouth, in which he expressed all that affection which he really felt for his grandfather, and all the pangs which it cost him to adhere to the conclusions he had already announced. In terms of tenderness, and even humility, he declined to become a candidate for Darlford, or even to enter Parliament, except as the master of his own conduct. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Lady Monmouth was reclining on a sofa in that beautiful boudoir which had been fitted up under the superintendence of Mr. Rigby, but, as he then believed, for the Princess Colonna. The walls were hung with amber satin, painted by Delaroche, with such subjects as might be expected from his brilliant and picturesque pencil. Fair forms, heroes and heroines in dazzling costume, the offspring of chivalry merging into what is commonly styled civilization, moved in graceful or fantastic groups amid palaces and gardens. The ceiling, carved in the deep honeycomb fashion of the Saracens, was richly gilt and picked out in violet. Upon a violet carpet of velvet was represented the marriage of Cupid and Psyche. It was about two hours after Coningsby had quitted Monmouth House, and Flora came in, sent for by Lady Monmouth, as was her custom, to read to her as she was employed with some light work. "'Tis a new book of Sue, said Lucretia. They say it is good. Flora, seated by her side, began to read. Reading was an accomplishment which distinguished Flora. But today her voice faltered, her expression was uncertain. She seemed but imperfectly to comprehend her page. More than once Lady Monmouth looked round at her with an inquisitive glance. Suddenly Flora stopped and burst into tears. "'Oh, madam!' she at last exclaimed. "'If you would but speak to Mr. Coningsby, all might be right.' "'What is this?' said Lady Monmouth, turning quickly on the sofa. Then, collecting herself in an instant, she continued with less abruptness and more suavity than usual. "'Tell me, Flora, what is it? What is the matter?' "'My lord,' sobbed Flora, "'has quarrelled with Mr. Coningsby.' An expression of eager interest came over the countenance of Lucretia. "'Why have they quarrelled?' "'I do not know they have quarrelled. It is not perhaps a right term, but my lord is very angry with Mr. Coningsby.' "'Not very angry, I should think, Flora. And about what?' "'Oh, very angry, madam,' said Flora, shaking her head mournfully. "'My lord told Monsieur Villebecque that perhaps Mr. Coningsby would never enter the house again.' "'Was it to-day?' asked Lucretia. "'This morning. Mr. Coningsby has only left this hour or two. He will not do what my lord wishes about some seat in the chamber. I do not know exactly what it is, but my lord is in one of his moods of terror. My father is frightened even to go into his room when he is so.' "'Has Mr. Rigby been here to-day?' asked Lucretia. "'Mr. Rigby is not in town.' 
My father went for Mr. Rigby this morning, before Mr. Coningsby came, and he found that Mr. Rigby was not in town. That is why I know it. Lady Monmouth rose from her sofa, and walked once or twice up and down the room. Then, turning to Flora, she said, Go away now. The book is stupid. It does not amuse me. Stop. Find out all you can for me about the quarrel before I speak to Mr. Coningsby. Flora quitted the room. Lucretia remained for some time in meditation. Then she wrote a few lines, which she dispatched at once to Mr. Rigby. End of chapter 5